common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or, or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. Thank you. This mic wasn't ready for my vertically challenged body, so uh, I got my height back. Um, so here we go. Um, I want to actually, let me just acknowledge, I know Dr. Lewis is unable to join us today. Currently, we're missing Mr. Campbell Gooch. And other than that, am I missing someone else? I think there's just two of us, correct? OK, well, we certainly have quorum, so we're appropriate in that matter. I, I'd like to start. And I want to just acknowledge we do have an um, uh, ambitious uh, agenda, but for a good reason. Uh, and we'll be very thoughtful in our approach here and how we um, use everyone's time today. Um, let me begin by just making sure that, one, we have the sheet that is going around or has been accessible to the public to, for the public comment. Great. Thank you. And I'd like to begin with a bit of an update. I just want to share with the board. Uh, some of my activity and action here, and then um, some of this may just be in, help us be informed as we move through the agenda this afternoon. So um, after our last meeting, um, I contacted uh, members of uh, then Mayor Elect Cooper's transition team. I sent an email, I saw online rather, I saw that um, this former Councilwoman Brenda Haywood, as well as Mrs. Mary Falls were listed as uh, the key point of contacts. So I did send an email um, to Mrs. Haywood. I also sent her a message um, online. Uh, she had a, through Facebook Messenger, was receiving messages that way. I didn't receive a response back. I did contact Mrs. Falls by, uh, by phone. I didn't have an email address, but I did leave a voicemail. Um, through my contacts, I have not heard back. However, Mr. Whedon did, did reach out by email, uh, also phone call as well. Uh, we received a response Yesterday, is that right, Mr. Whedon? Is it yesterday? Uh, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, that um, Mayor Let Cooper, or Mayor Cooper, pardon, pardon me, uh, was unable to accept the invitation to be here tonight. However, he has extended an invitation for um, uh, the COB to meet with him on either Monday or Tuesday of next week. And um, we understand that based on you know state law, we're not allowed to have several members of the, the board present, more than one, quite frankly. I accepted the invitation for the Tuesday, um, October 8th meeting at 3 o'clock, uh, 3 p.m., am I right, Mr. Whedon? 3 p.m. is correct. 3 p.m., and, uh, and then started to stir here. I want to make sure I'm, you know, I accepted this meeting on behalf of the board, and, but I also want to make sure that I'm, um, doing what the board thinks is uh, proper as far as representation. As chair, I'm certainly always happy, willing, and want to be in this space. However, I think in previous meetings, if I'm correct in my remembrance here, we had decided uh, that either Mr. Cooper or Dr. Hildreth uh, would represent us in those types of meetings. And so I, I, we can certainly come back to this, but I just want to revisit that and say that if we need to, you know, again, put a motion on the floor for this new meeting that we now have on the table, uh, we certainly can come back to it. So, um, and I'll open the floor here for conversation here if we need to at the end of that. The other two things I just want to point out, uh, and I said this before we, we agreed as a board, we will continue to extend an invitation uh, to Chief Anderson uh, to join us at uh, any of our public meetings. Um, we will also continue to work outside of these meetings uh, to set up uh, meetings with him as well. My hope, however, is through um, the um, good uh, confidence of Mayor Cooper, we will have someone that will be willing and able to convene that meeting uh, as Chief Anderson continues to be unavailable at the meetings that we've extended. However, we will continue to put his name on this agenda and the invitation will continue to be extended. Mr. Whedon, I just want to make sure you're uh, understanding too, when we say this here in this meeting, we that means that uh, as soon as we are, let's say here, we're looking at October 23rd uh, is our next meeting, if I'm not 
uh, wrong here. We want to make sure we're giving the chief as much of a fair, you know, far away notice as possible. So as soon as October 3rd, we can reach out to him now to say, you are cordially invited to this meeting. And that invitation should be posted online as well. So that there's no confusion whatsoever, um, that the floor remains open and the community welcomes th this engagement. So, um, you know, Mr. Ross, just one moment. Um, so Mr. Whedon, is that understood there? Yes, uh, post the invitation online and uh, we will extend the invitation to the chief to uh, appear at the 23rd meeting. Okay, thank you. And then um, let's see here, there's one more thing. I also just want to uh, be clear around um, other conversations I've had with Mr. Whedon. And so I believe on our last executive committee meeting agenda, I had a, an item on there and I think maybe on this one, I, two meetings ago, I had one listed uh, as continuous improvement. Um, and I wanna be very clear about what I mean around that. We've, we've talked about the reports being submitted a week ahead of time, giving the board as much notice as possible on the content that's gonna be in front of you. Um, we. No, it's not perfect. I, I won't even say it's great right now, but we are going to get better in this space, right? We understand a lot is coming into our staff's uh, information portals and offices. We want to be thoughtful and respectful of that, but I want the board to know that I am working very closely with Mr. Whedon here on this, um, also just on the style and product that we submit as well to ensure that it, it meets uh, the excellence of the staff that we have. Um, so I'll pause there, acknowledge Ms. Ross and then Mr. Jam uh, Jamel uh, Campbell-Gooch if he has a statement. Yes, in terms of the police chief's response, he did send a response today at 12.35 p.m. stating that if I'm allowed to read his statement, I will not be available to this meet this afternoon. I trust that our regular meetings will continue as we move forward. Certainly, any of the board members would be welcome to attend as well when we meet, and this was to Mr. Wheaton, so I just want everybody to know that uh, the chief did respond at 12.30 today. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Okay. Thank you, and this was sent to Mr. Wheaton. Did we get this by email, or how do Oh, we got that uh, late today by, or late this afternoon by email. Uh, you got it? Didn't have time to uh, send it to everyone. I had already left, so we was able to print it out and provide okay. hard copies. Did you follow up with Chief Anderson since he sent this email? No, I've, I've been uh, running around. I came, I left the office about 1 or one thirty or so. Okay, and, and it sounds like certain members of the board did receive this, so Ms. We Ms. Ms. Ross, did you receive it? We just uh, delivered it uh, to everyone. Just got it here. Oh, it's in the pile. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, got it. I haven't gotten a chance to read through this. Mr. Campbell Gooch, thank you. I mean, I had I had another statement about like any assistance that you need, Chair Whedon. I know we got to be very strategic about working together to build the system, but anything you need from me as a board member, please let me know. But after reading the email and seeing it in front of me, I mean, is there room to make that where multiple board members are present and we trigger a, a public meeting with that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Mr. Pinckney, are we uh, kind of painted in there? What's our flexibility there? Uh, just under the open meetings, I you to have to ensure that there's some kind of public notice and then the public would have to be allowed into that meeting. Mr. Cooper. Uh, Mr. Pinkney, what if uh, multiple board members attended to observe but did not participate in any discussion? Would that require public notice? I would need to double check before I could give you a concrete answer on that. Um, my understanding of the, of the act is that if the board members are discussing board business, so I would need to just dig in a little deeper if being an audience member would count as discussing board business. Yeah, I believe the act says that the board members uh, deliberate toward a decision. So if there's no deliberation, they would not, it would not trigger uh, the public uh, or the, the open meetings law and given, and if they all remain silent, uh, it would be hard to see how they would be yeah. deliberating. If, if that's what it says, and I, yeah. it's been a while since I've read the actual act, uh, if that's what it says, then I don't know that we would need to jump through all the extra hoops. 
So is it possible, I, I take this point, and I myself haven't read it since we started on the board here, um, when we first went through the training and together as a, as a, as a group. Um, I think it would be great if we could get you know, confirmation, great if we can just get a short uh, memo on that for that. everyone's understanding, um, because this is certainly going to come up again and again. Um, before I, my statement, I want to give Mr. Campbell Gooch the floor here. I think he had something to say. I just wanted to state that I strongly agree on taking the chief up on his offer. Absolutely. I think it's great. And actually, when is the next, he says, regular meeting? So when, when would that be? Well, we don't actually have any regularly scheduled meetings. I proposed regularly scheduled meetings, but they, they, that uh, proposal wasn't accepted by the chief. Uh, uh -huh. So I don't know what he means by it. It sounds like the door is meeting. wide open, though. It does. Yeah. So I, we, we, we can schedule something. Yeah, absolutely. I think like, it's fine. I, if he needs to think the idea is his, great. Um, say, so glad you want to have a regular meeting, Chief Anderson. When is your next, you know, early availability? Um, and, and, and maybe we pause in this and kind of in the same stream while we're on this, when we talk about we're going to wait to hear back from Mr. Pinckney. But in the short frame, we talked about, we, we spoke about, you know, our mayor, mayoral um, nominees and representatives on the board being part of the Mayor Cooper space. I think we should perhaps think about what it means for uh, you know, someone in a former law enforcement background um, sitting across the table next to, to you as well, Mr. Wheaton and Mrs. Fitcher in those spaces. I, I certainly won't put any, you know, no words in anyone's mouth here, but I, I think if we think it makes sense in one space, it makes sense in the other. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking at three of you all without looking at you. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Sweeney. Yeah, as far as the next meeting, Today, I, I suspect that we'll approve the um, draft proposal of the MOU. That would then be ready for presentation to the chief. And that might be the basis to just start the discussions. So, it, Mr. Sweeney, your point is to set up that meeting with the idea that uh, kind of foundation of it yeah. is to yeah. discuss the yeah. MOU. Uh, yeah, I don't know that there needs to be some other separate Mm -hmm. Meeting. Whatever mm -hmm. else we need to talk about, we could probably talk about it at that same sure. meeting. And then use whatever date that is to go ahead and put a permanent hold for a reoccurring meeting on the calendar. Uh, it sounds like what, what we would be in the space of. Okay. Um, any additional comments, thoughts here uh, before we, we move here from this space, just in the idea of being efficient? Um, Ms. Mr. Cooper, Dr. Hildreth. Um, I'd love to get ideas if you're open to it. I, we don't have a motion on the floor, but if you would like to represent us, no need to turn, Dr. Hildreth, it is fine. Thank you. Um, I would bring back to our remembrance that at the emergency meeting of September 11th, this board voted for two meetings. The first one we voted for in chronological order of our action was to have a meeting with the mayor um, in the mayor's office with Ms. Director Whedon and one of the two mayoral appointees present, Mr. Sweeney or myself. Then we voted for an invitation of the mayor, whoever that may be, back where we were historically, and the chief to come. And then there was some discussion about which meeting was to occur first. And I think um, there was a majority vote on Mr. Sweeney's motion that the meeting with the mayor, the smaller meeting, happened first. As I recall, that did not happen. We established that. We asked the question and received the answer. Uh, this meeting on September 18th. So in terms of the work of the board, there is that meeting that we voted on that has yet to happen. Um, so that said, I will say, point of personal privilege, I will be out of state on business travel next week. So if the meeting with the mayor's office is that time, I am unavailable. I think it's up to the board to determine whether we would like to continue the work we voted on by asking Mr. Cooper to attend 
or whether, in fact, we want the chair to. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Just Mr. Cooper. And if I could just uh, add to the calendar woes, I was looking at my calendar, and I have an unavoidable conflict on Tuesday uh, at uh, 3 p.m. Okay. And uh, but, but I guess I would also point out that I think the spirit of uh, the proposal was that uh, one of the two people appointed by the then sitting mayor right. go speak to the mayor. Uh, since uh, there is now a new mayor, um, I'm not, you know, I think while either one of us would be delighted to do that, mm -hmm. uh, part of the rationale may not still be as strong. Sure. No, I think that makes perfect sense. Ms. Ms. Ross. Okay, in terms of transparency, I think that the community needs to be involved and be informed. Mm -hmm. And not only the single meeting with the mayor mm -hmm. and the chief, we still need the mayor and the chief here at a meeting. We're talking about transparency, we're talking about partnering and working together, mm -hmm. and the communities are backbone. Mm -hmm. So I still think that we have that meeting or here with the community. Yes, Ms. Ross, actually, and, I, and that's my apologies for not making that clear, uh, one does not substitute the other in my mind. Uh, and I think, it, I, you know, I've made plans to attend. I, I will represent the board at this meeting. I understand, and thank you for the transparency on calendars. I understand it's short notice, too. Um, but I've made plans to make it very, very clear. All of this conversation here for introductory meeting is all well and good, but we need to see you in front of the community, right? right? Uh, and, and quickly, quite frankly, because I recognize there's a lot going on in Nashville, but I can't quite think of too many things that topple uh, the importance of figuring it out quickly how the chief of police and our executive director work collaboratively in the effort and spirit of this community oversight board. Uh, and that's in due respect of all the great things and, and things that are going on in Nashville. So uh, I will promise the board this. A meeting takes place in the afternoon of Tuesday, October 8th. Um, no later than October 9th at 9 a.m. You'll have my full report and readout um, for um, what happened and what was promised and transpired in that meeting. I'll send it, quite frankly, probably over the evening of the 8th so that by the time our, um, our uh, staff gets in the office, they can immediately post it and share it out to the board um, as well. Um, does that work for everyone? Does that sound okay? All right. And Mr. Whedon, I'll work very closely with you. I did share before, but I do think it's important uh, that we be fully aligned um, going into this meeting. Um, we don't take this time for granted, and so we'll make time before that, that, that meeting on Tuesday uh, to sit down together as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next thing on our agenda here is the executive director report. Oh, before I move there, let me just be very clear. Mr. Whedon, if you could get, just give me an update. Um, I don't need to be on the email, but I'd like to know that uh, an email response is sent to Chief Anderson as soon as possible, accepting his invitation for a regularly scheduled meeting, uh, and also sharing that um, we, and we can come back to this, uh, we'll likely have a member of the COB present for that meeting as well. Uh, and we'll, we'll certainly circle back on that. Uh, we next have the executive director report. I'm, I'm assuming, I'm, is it in this, um, this one here, the, the, the uh, taller, okay, stack for it. Mr. Whedon, if you wouldn't mind um, walking us through the, uh, your report, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Davis. Uh, yes, I provided a written copy of the executive director's report uh, prior to the meeting to the board. I'll provide a uh, brief synopsis of that report. Uh, I began with the training issue or the training topic. Uh, but we did attend as a, a staff, all the uh, nine staff members attended the NACO conference that was held in Detroit, Michigan, uh, the 22nd through the 26th of September. In addition, board members Ross and Hildreth also attended the conference. Uh, the title of that conference was Courage, Collaboration, and Community. Uh, it was a very successful conference. About 500 people attended. Uh, several um, oversight agencies from across the country were there, as well as several chiefs of police of various jurisdictions. Uh, namely, I recall New Orleans, D.C., and Detroit, uh, chief of police being there and making presentations at the conference. Uh, so it was a very successful conference. We did provide a, uh, a link 
to the full materials that were made available to attendees. Uh, we provided that link to the board through a separate email. And in addition to the materials that are available for the 2019 conference, there are also materials available for the 2018 conference that are still posted if, uh, if the board wishes to look at those as well. One thing uh, of note that uh, might be of interest to the board is uh, the fact that the NACOL conference for 2021, September or October 2021, is currently a request for proposal uh, for cities to host that conference. Uh, I don't know if uh, Nashville wants to be one of those cities, but I did talk to Atlanta and I know that they're putting in for it. So uh, if you want to give Atlanta a run for their money, we need to. Uh, We're already better than Atlanta. <laughs> Thank you. We we need we need to put our request for a proposal in by December 13th of uh, this year, of, to hold that conference in 2021. Uh, second item is uh, concerns the Citizens Police Academy. We attended the fifth week of the academy last night, uh, fifth of 12 weeks. Is that right? 12 weeks. Fifth of 12 weeks, and we continue to attend that conference. Um, I have uh, arranged for a, a training that I th will be beneficial, I believe, to the community as well as to the board and the staff members uh, involving procedural justice and police legitimacy, one of the main topics of concern for 21st century policing. Uh, we've arranged for the national trainers of that program who are members of the Chicago Police Department to uh, come to Nashville on the 24th and 25th of October and present the full two-day training on uh, police, uh, just procedural justice and pol uh, police legitimacy. It's a full two-day, eight-hour training program. And we anticipate having that training program held at uh, American Baptist College. Um, the uh, trainers have indicated that uh, because of the nature of the training, the interactive nature of the training, they wanna limit the participation to 50 attendees uh, the training will be open to the public. We'll post it on the website and uh, people will be able to sign up to attend. We'll take the first 50 or so uh, people that uh, sign up to attend that conference on the 24th and 25th of October. Uh, next topic for discussion was operations. Uh, we have uh, the cost of the conference, of course, uh, is free to the public. Uh, so there will be no charge to the public or any uh, board members or staff members that attend that conference. Mr. Whedon, how would the public uh, register to attend? Oh, we're we're going to uh, set up a registration on, online uh, through the website so okay. that uh, members can, can register. I provided our uh, next section uh, is entitled operations. I provided a uh, case activity summary uh, that, uh, that you have in front of you, the board members should have in front of you. Uh, Basically, as a summary, we have 25 cases that have gone through the intake process. Uh, 11 of those cases were open for investigation with eight of those remaining open for investigation. Uh, three of those uh, are policy review as well or pending policy reviews. The next item is case records request. We have submitted uh, records requests to Metro Police Department on 10 cases, eight of which are investigations and two our pending policy reviews. And uh, you can refer to the document uh, entitled Complaint Records Requests for further information on those records and uh, the responses. Last, uh, the next item is the uh, database request from- Mr. Uh, Whedon, could yes. you just uh, point out that, that uh, document for us? We're trying to follow along with you. Uh, that would be the document that is- This one here? Yes. yes. yes okay, thank you. Okay. All right. And that's... It, it should be in, in, in all of your packets. It should be in all of your packets. Okay, yep. should be in all of your packets. Okay. Uh, as you search for that... Uh, the next subject uh, consists of uh, our database requests from our research analysts. At the present time, we, we had requested four databases, four databases. Uh, those databases were the use of force database, 
incident database, arrest database, and uh, Office of Professional Accountability data database from the Metro Police Department. Uh, as you recall the conversation at the last meeting, there was some issue regarding the, the, the cost of uh, obtaining those databases. Uh, since the last board meeting, we did receive those databases in a thumb drive, thumb drive format. Uh, all four databases in a thumb drive format was substantially all of the information that was requested by uh, Dr. Verlier and um, there was no charge for those thumb drives or the information that was received. So, uh, what was the previously um, uh, quoted? It, it was, the previous I think quote? It was, was it six million or something? It's, it was in the millions. Uh, so it went from several million dollars to zero dollars. That that is correct. And forever, and forever. And, and it didn't take 130 years or hours, man hours. Uh, it, uh, we, it took time for us to get back from Detroit, so we left for Detroit. Technology, okay. Back, so. That's great. That's yes. really good news. Okay. Good to know. All Thank right. you. That was the thing. Uh, next item concerns the uh, website uh, documentation and uh, accessibility. We had a conversation with the IT service, or services director, uh, Durbin, Keith Durbin and uh, his web manager, Randall Williams, on the 22nd, I believe, of September, and talked about how documents could be, particularly the PDF documents, would become accessible for posting on the COB and MNCO websites. And uh, I think the, the issue really concerned about uh, uh, those PDFs have to be in a, an original format, or uh, if they are, uh, they just can't be scanned or converted from a non-original format. So that seems to have been the problem. In fact, for this particular board meeting, I, all of the documents that I submitted to ITS for posting on the websites, both the uh, MCO website and, and uh, COB website, I sent to them in a PDF format that was from the original source, and they had no problem posting those documents. So I, I think we've solved that issue. Um, it seems to be working well. Uh, uh, I gave them several documents, and not one was sent back, unable to uh, unable to upload. So, uh, very happy to get that issue resolved. Uh, the next item on uh, my executive director report deals with the Metro Police Department. We've already discussed Chief Anderson's uh, response uh, that uh, was received uh, recently. Uh, in addition to that, we did receive a request from the Fraternal Order of Police on the 27th of September. FOP President James Smallwood requested some particular background information on all COB employees in addition to COB board members. Uh, that background information that Mr. Smallwood requested was copies of employment applications, copies of any background investigation reports, copies of any reference letters or related documents, and any other documents or information provided by applicants or by the uh, uh, Metro employees or oversight uh, board members. I uh, directed Mr. Smallwood to the, the, the proper party that should receive that request, that being Metro clerk's office and told him that he should make his request to the Metro Clerk's Office through the Open Records Act. Um, so that would be the proper course to obtain those, that documentation, and he's been so advised. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Whedon. Uh, let us pause here. We have a few questions. Mr. Campbell Gooch, Mr. Cooper, and then Mr. Hollow. Um, I actually had a question about the training. Yes. I don't, I don't know if that's going to throw things off. Um, you, you mentioned that it would be police officers from Chicago doing the training? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, they're uh, national trainers. They uh, okay. <laughs> presented. And, and I'm just curious, will they, do you know if they'll be armed while they're doing the training? I don't know if they'll be armed while they're doing the training. I would suppose not, Okay. Uh, and, but I can check. Oh, and then my next question is about the data. Um, what happens when it is updated? Is that is that going to be the form that we're constantly getting the, the um, access to records from? It's through the USB drive? Let me ask uh, Dr. Valier if he can answer that question because he's been more intimately involved with that. 
and I, and I know and I know, Doctor, that you just need a data set just in case there is a policy review. But I'm just curious about what would happen if we needed an update on that data. Yeah. So the plan is right now that we'll request updated databases every quarter, which means that we'd receive updated databases every three months. Um, the issue with that is that we have to request previously in time as well, so because databases are updated constantly. Mm -hmm. So if a case is closed, an arrest is made, that data changes. We also want to be aware that there are expungements where the data changes in, in the past. So we'll be requesting updates every, at this point with how we are receiving data, we'll be requesting every three months uh, in order to make sure that we have up-to-date data. And what would be ideal for you? I know um, circumstances is three months, but. So after being at the NACOL conference and seeing that there are about one third of the, bo of the organizations that they surveyed have some sort of a direct database access, that is something that could be negotiated as a board with Metro Legal. That is something that other agencies that are doing police monitoring do have. Um, but at this point, since it, we have an understanding around what data is being available and that's something we're continuing to work on around what is and is not available to us, uh, we'll be requesting it as regularly as we need. Um, once we Now that we have the data and, we, and we're starting to understand what is available, we can start creating reports and then at, update them as we need. That's all the questions I have. I yield my time. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Mr. Campbell Gooch, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> uh, yes, Mr. Whedon, a uh, question on this public uh, records request from the FOP. Um, so we have forwarded that to the Metro Clerk's Office. Is that a uh, standard procedure for all Metro boards and commissions? Uh, no, I didn't forward the request to the Metro Clerk's Office. I told Mrs. Smallwood that his request should probably properly be made. To the uh, Metro that he call. should resubmit it to yes. Metro Clerk, and on what basis did we give them that advice? Well, that was the advice that I received from uh, Metro HR. Okay. Um, so that's what all boards and commissions do? I, I would not know, but that, that was the advice that I received from Metro HR. Okay. Um, I would request, perhaps, Mr. Pinkley, you could look into this. Um, you know, state law and the uh, Office of uh, Open, uh, excuse me, of Open Records Council require that every governmental entity subject to the Public Records Act have a public records policy. Um, so, if you could inquire and see whether the Metro policy, and I'm assuming there is one. Uh, extends to boards and commissions, and whether there's any action that this board needs to take with regard to that. You know, I would say certainly on something like a request for personnel records, the HR department is the right place to go. I can see us in the future getting a public records request that goes directly to records maintained uh, by the board staff, and I'm not sure HR would be the right people to talk to about that. So. We uh, need to know what, uh, what obligations we have and to have a policy in place, particularly if we find ourselves in a position where we need to charge a copying cost or something of that sort because we can't if we don't have a properly promulgated policy. So if you would look into that and report back to us, I'd appreciate it. I, I can. Uh, I can tell you that we are working on a, a policy for the board and for our office. Um, okay. As this was a kind of an employment records request, that's why it was forwarded to HR. Understood, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Holloway. Yes, I think um, what I see at the FOP is doing, they doing, it kind of like doing a witch hunt. They're trying to find out any information that they can to try to destroy the credibility of the board here. And um, they probably, what they want to do is go through the application process and see what they can find, anything that negative would destroy our credibility and some information they may already have. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Mr. Campbell Gooch, Mr. Sweeney. Um, in the same light, I was just curious about how my fellow board members are feeling about this email because as I read through it, it just, I mean, I just wanted to know, Walter kind of went into it, but I just want to know how other people are reading this just to see what other people's perspectives are about this. Thank you. 
I'll acknowledge Mr. Sweeney and then anyone else that might want to respond to Mr. Campbell Gooch's uh, statement there. Mine is a different subject, so if you want to okay. get responses on that well, first. Would anyone else mine. like to re respond there? I, I take Mr. Campbell Gooch's um, uh, point. I personally thought, well, if we uh, were garnering their attention. I hope they feel so inclined to come and speak as a member of the public. I um, also know that when you're doing good work, you're likely to get somebody um, unhappy with you. And at least my grandmama said it's always to have at least two people mad at you so you can keep working hard. I'm okay with that. Um, I welcome it, in fact, um, because the, the spirit of what we're doing here is for the betterment of this community. I mean, Mr. Campbell Gooch, you yourself and the work that you've done, yeah, I, I can imagine you got some folks who don't want to invite you to Sunday dinner, but a whole lot more that do. Um, and so I, I take this, and I hope that as a board, I mean, we work collectively here. We don't always have to agree. But the one thing that we do agree on is that we are going to think with the people in mind. Um, and so I, I would I would urge the FOP and, and their leadership with requests like this to ensure that there's good purpose behind it, really, is what we're so hoping. And perhaps the tone and tenor of this uh, letter was unintended. Um, uh, and, but there's always a way to uh, hit delete and write a new one. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. An Martinez. I would add that most of the information that they're requesting from board members is already publicly available on our website. Our interviews are on YouTube and they're linked on our website. All of our application materials are there, so they can do their research. I agree, Mr. Campbell Gooch. And um, just to, just to kind of add, my concern isn't really with my, I mean, opportunities to share with, with other board members, I think are great just as a temperature check on how other people are feeling, but my main concern when it comes to this thing is not me, it's my, the people around me. And so that's, that's just kind of, when I read the tone and the tone of this, that's, that's where my mind immediately went to my young people and to the people that I serve in the community. Thank you, Mr. Cam Gooch. Mr. Sw uh, Ms. Dr. Hildreth, apologies. Thank you, responding to the question. Um, one of the things that gives me great comfort is our continued insistence on transparency and process. So, for example, I was extremely gratified to hear my colleague, Mr. Cooper, ask very clear, pointed, directed questions about the nature, the pathway for the work. And if we continue to model that with everything we do, so the transparency is the posting, and we are able to do that, to have a policy that is written that we can be held accountable to and to which we can hold others accountable. As long as there's a level playing field in that regard, I say bring it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hildren. Uh, Ms. Ross, apologies. Oh, that's fine. I feel that uh, if we're making someone happy all the time, then we're not doing our job. I agree. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Um, a, a question on the report on the status of matters, Mr. Whedon on the status of matters. So do I understand correctly that as of today, mm -hmm. there is one matter that is held up because of lack of records? Is that correct? And that's matter number three? Which one's it? 2019 3C. One second. 2019-3C is right on the front page. That's correct. That's correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And that matter is still held up? Yes. Okay. And and what's so. the process for going through and trying to work that free? That's the criminal one, right? That's uh, Assistant Director Jill uh, Fitcher will answer that. It's a real one. 
Yes, 2019-003 um, is a case that is held up because of records. Um, they denied the records because of Rule 16 of criminal procedure. So what we're going to do is get with the liaison from the district attorney's office and see if we can get those records. And since that's just a, something that just was facilitated, we'll probably get you know on that right. once we are able to get in contact well, with her. That was my question. When we met last, there was that liaison, and I want to know if we followed up on that. Right. Right. and where we are and making that request of the liaison to get that to see if there's further movement. That right, we got our information and we're going to forward, we have two actually to forward to her to see if she can assist us with those. Okay. Um, is, is, this is a matter that is subject to a criminal investigation, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay, now under our rules, if I recall correctly, if a matter is a criminal investigation, it's either stayed automatically or it's going to be stayed? Well, that's, uh, I think that's if the, uh, if the officer is under criminal investigation. Is that, uh, yeah. This is, this is not the situation where the officer is under criminal okay. investigation. Okay. This, the, the, uh, uh, so that the wouldn't apply. Got it. Okay. So when we, we meet next, you'll tell us what the status of this is based upon discussions with the DA? Yes, in fact, we, uh, that was the next item, one of the next items on the agenda. We have a uh, meeting scheduled for uh, next Friday with the district attorney liaison. So we'll discuss these cases then. Okay. M Mr. You. Cooper? Just a quick follow-up on Mr. Sweeney's line of questioning. On this matter, 003C, um, so that's a matter under investigation. Is there an active criminal case at this point, point? There is an active criminal case at this point, and the complainant has actually kind of fallen off and not followed up, and we've been trying to get in contact with that complainant um, through that complainant's attorney and through other means, and so we, the next step is to try to get the records that we can from the DA's liaison. Uh, and I would think one relevant uh, question to ask from our previous meeting and the uh, uh, statements made by uh, General Funk is whether he said he has an open file policy and if that material has been shared with defense counsel, mm -hmm. then Rule 16 may not no longer be an issue. That's correct. Th this case is still in the indictment process. Okay, so it's not at that point yet. Right, that's Got correct. It. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Whedon, I see here that you've mentioned the DA liaison. Um, that really just gives an overview of um, what we were here to witness. Um, the district attorney, uh, General Funk, um, appointed uh, Mrs. Charles, DA Charles. I understand the meeting next Friday. I just want to be clear, is there a regularly scheduled meeting with um, DA Charles on your calendar yet? Well, this is this will be our first meeting. We want to schedule at least monthly meetings with okay. her. So uh, this will definitely be at least once a month. Okay, so you'll have regularly scheduled meetings with her. Yes. In the DC MOU, as well as the DC notification system, so the MOU has been fully signed by all parties? Uh, the MOU is here for the board to review and sign. Thank you. Um, and the, in your staff now, Mr. Whedon, is now completely operational in the RAVE um, notification system. We are. Which is um, what we spoke about. Anything additional on the DEC side to share on that? Other than uh, what's already stated in your report? No, there's just, uh, I'll go over the MOU a little bit later in the, in the meeting, but uh, it's, it's been agreed to by both parties. We just need signatures at this point. Great, and as far as uh, TBI, I'll pause there, let you pick back up. Um, but in the interest of time, I just want us to be succinct here in our review. So I'll give you the floor here, and if you could pick up with TBI. Uh, yeah, we met with the uh, uh, dep our executive director, Roush, and his executive team uh, yesterday or Monday, uh, discussed training opportunities and also operational, uh, how we would handle events if uh, TBI was in charge of a crime scene. And in essence, um, the way that our, our um, MOU was written now with the Metro Police Department and is 
the same with all jurisdictions, basically. Uh, and an oversight agency wouldn't be allowed into a active crime scene investigation until that active scene was closed down and was declared inactive. Uh, so we discussed this with uh, uh, the TBI uh, in the event that they would process a crime scene involving a Metro police officer. And their policy is that while the crime scene is active, they are the organization, law enforcement organization in charge of the investigation. Mm -hmm. So once they close that crime scene and secure it, they then turn it back over to Metro Police Department. So in essence, we wouldn't have any direct involvement with TBI because we couldn't go into that crime scene as it's still active. It's only once they complete the crime scene, close it and return it back to Metro, then our uh, our uh, MOU that's already, that's ready to be presented to Metro, which speaks of how we would interact with them at the crime scene would take place or would take precedent at that point. So our, our interaction with TBI would be very, very limited because of the nature of their investigation. Of the Mr. Whedon, uh, let us just be clear here. Was that the request that you made of TBI or is that what TBI is offering you? That, uh, that was the, what we needed to understand was when we could have access to a crime scene, they said that no law enforcement obviously is allowed, non-law enforcement is allowed into an active crime scene. Only when the active crime scene is declared closed would non-law enforcement people be allowed in. And at that point where they close their active investigation, they return it back to Metro Police Department. So Metro would take over at that point. So our MOU would again be in place. It would, so it would sort of be stayed until TBI completed their investigation. And once it's closed, the crime scene is closed, it'd be handed back to Metro as an inactive crime scene. And we would be allowed into the crime scene at that point. Okay. Mr. Sweeney. That's not, though, how the MOU would work if it's just a metro scene, right? No. We'd still no. get into an active crime scene. No, we can't get into an active metro crime scene. Only if the Metro Police Department is investigating the incident solely, uh, once Metro secures the crime scene and, uh, and is no longer active, then we would be allowed into the, the crime scene at that point, I believe. Well, the MOU that we put together, if I recall right, says secured, but it doesn't say closed. Uh, it doesn't say concluded. As I think a matter that, of fact, may, it, it implies at yeah. least that it's still an active scene. There may, there may be a term of art. It, it's still secured, but uh, it would not be an active crime scene. Because here our proposal says that once the scene is stabilized and secured, mm -hmm. that then we would be granted access. That's correct. It sounds like what you're saying is that the TBI has a higher standard. No, no, it, it's the same standard. I may have been using different terminology, but once the scene is stabilized and secured by TBI, they would then return it to Metro. Once they've collected all their evidence, secured the scene and stabilized the scene, they return the crime scene back over to Metro, and that's Okay. Uh, when we would be allowed. When I mean, it's if, if TBI is doing an investigation and they've done everything that they're going to do, what is there to turn back over? Well, there may, st there may still be evidence will still be remaining there. At the scene, you can, uh, lot, many times they leave markers and things there at the scene uh, so that uh, um, we can view it. So uh, that hopefully that is the situation, but as I understand it, uh, that's a policy that uh, that the TBI has in place. Okay. Have, have you spoken with either Memphis or Knoxville to see how they interact with I, the TBI in a in a local shooting situation? I have not. Memphis, uh, Knoxville is not. They don't have an investigative agency, and uh, Memphis does not have an investigative agency as well. So they wouldn't respond to crime scenes. They're both uh, auditor monitor agencies. Um, so that uh, uh, I don't think they would be able to help us that much in that regard. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
Mr. Whedon, um, on the mediation side, it says that uh, Mr. Pinckney will um, be addressing us soon on the uh, mediation program, so I don't think we need to talk too much there. And I also noticed that the permanent space will be open and completed, or rather completed, um, ready for Halloween, so. Yes. Is that correct? So we will anticipate that, maybe before Halloween. Will it, um, Will it be, so you, you're, you're anticipating perhaps you all can move in before Halloween, maybe? Miss mm, Fitcher has been closely involved in that. She'll yeah. Like to know. As she said, uh, the lady that runs the building said that we probably would be able to sign the lease by November the 1st. Um, so we anticipate being able to move in um, the week of um, that week, October, the that week of the October the 31st. But that's not set in stone. Gotcha. They've been working really hard there, though. It, it sounds like it. I mean, I think you all told me it was a pie in the sky to think to get in there yeah. before the end of the year, so that's great to hear. Um, I'd love it, and we've spoke about this before, but now that we have, a, we have a, a date within eyesight here, and I know you all are very eager to get into your permanent space, uh, if you could just come back to the board and let us know a bit more about when you think you would be ready to have the open house for the community um, to come into the new space, to familiarize their cell, you know, themselves with their space as well, right? right. Um, we've sp spoken about having you know, maybe food or something catered um, to welcome people in. I'd love it if we could um, get that on the date and calendar for everyone sooner rather than later. Um, it'd be great. Um, that is fantastic. I, I don't know who was betting against you. I'm looking at Miss Person. I think she said y'all wouldn't get in there. So that's good to see. Uh, she was wrong. Thank you. Mr. Whedon, anything additionally, uh, additional you want to add before we move forward? Okay. No, Chair Davis. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I do want to just quickly uh, pause and acknowledge uh, Dr. Hildreth as well as and primarily Ms. Ms. Ross, who rep represented the board. Is there anything you would uh, like to bring and share with your colleagues here about your experience there? Uh, yes. Um, one of the main things that I got from the conference, and it was like a lot of the main things, I spent a lot of time in my first two days playing bingo. And on the bingo board, you had to meet at least 30 folks from around the United States that did different things within the uh, oversight community. One of the main things that, uh, some of the main things I bring back is still community engagement. And I look at our uh, new council, our new mayor, and there needs to be more training and education within our communities. And I'm hoping that Ms. Breezy, our community liaison, can get that up and running as soon as possible. Media. It's the way that the media portrays our community oversight board here in Nashville. I think that people don't realize that we have a community oversight staff and a community oversight board. And does the community really understand what community oversight is? Um, independent. We need to stay independent. Um, and I would also like to see an independent council. Hopefully we can find an independent council to work along with Todd that would do independent counseling on a pro bono basis. So, so that's some of the things, and there's so, so much more. I was glad that we took the stop, uh, what was traffic stop here in Nashville. Uh, it was very rewarding. And in Detroit, they had attacked us of police officers, and I can truly pinpoint why an officer shot an individual or got shot because of the training that we just received here in Nashville at the Police Training Academy. And I would like to encourage our community members to attend a Police Training Academy. It's very informative, particularly on traffic stops. So it, it was so much information, and uh, the only thing I disliked was the cold. I froze the whole conference. <laughs> Thank you for sacrificing for us, Mr. Austin. <laughs> Dr. Hildreth. 
One other thing, uh, I asked Jill, and I don't know if anybody looked at it throughout the conference, the guidebook while we were there, and I also brought back a packet for each board member. It's a little thick, and I had to take it out my suitcase because I was two pounds overweight, so I appreciate you uh, read this information. It's very informative information. You may want to talk about police chiefs. Thank you. Um, and so just to remind everybody, the board voted to send Ms. Ross as the board representative. And so we did that. I went independently. I attended all day on Wednesday and also Thursday morning. And as Ms. Ross indicated, the abundance of information was just overwhelming, particularly identifying other programs around the country and other personnel who have been doing this work for a while, who have been sharing with each other. And I particularly would like for us to look at the work in Seattle. I do not remember the gentleman's last name. I didn't come prepared to report to this, but his first name is Andrew, and he is amazing. Not only in terms of the steady, careful, evidence-based way in which they do the work, but their attention to community engagement, their even-handedness, part of the magic in independence is having the trust of the entire community. And as we say and we believe, law enforcement is a part of our community. So understanding that we do it all and they model that. So one of um, my hopes going forward is that individuals that presented, will, we will find some way in this community to bring them to Nashville, whether that requires a partnership with the universities, with other entities, with the government. There are individuals that I would hope we could bring for maybe three days and make sure that they can present to city council to the mayor's office, to various communities, to educators, everybody. Because the more we understand the different types of models, for example, maybe you don't know that in some jurisdictions, community oversight, police oversight is housed in an auditing office. So they report to the chief auditor. So there's something I learned called the yellow book. Anybody accountants in the room? You know, the generally accepted principles of accounting. They, there were presentations where they pull that out and that's part of their guidebook for how they proceed to go through the work. So that was important. The other thing that I think was stunning was the active engagement of police chiefs. To have police chiefs who were present who were on panels, who communicated with each other, who communicated with laypersons, um, that this does not need to be a contentious relationship. And that if we understand that we are looking for safety and inclusion of our entire community, there are other possibilities, there are other models. We saw those and we are, I think we all came back renewed with that vision and we continue to hold to that as we move forward. So thank you. Oh, and I found her bingo sheet. She was not over the club bingo. This was <laughs> part of the materials. When I came late, it's like, I don't know what this is. So we have that. The last piece is the guidebook. There is an app called guidebook, guidebook.com. So if you go to it and download it, what I'm not clear about is whether any of us can get to it. I don't think it was linked to our registration. But within guidebook and when you search for the, the entity, the NACO conference, if you can get to it, please do that because every single session has a tab electronically, and within that, not only is the abstract, the um, panel participants, but any materials that the panel submitted, so PowerPoints, reports, are linked directly through that. So phenomenal resource, very consistent with our commitment to transparency and inclusive community learning. So thank you for that opportunity to be in this space. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Uh, Mr. Martinez, turn around. Mr. Campbell Gooch. I think his last name is Myersburg. 
He's a, I think he's a di director, I believe. I met him. I met him in New York at the policing project training. Um, and Seattle also has a, a mechanism where they have a community advisory board that works alongside the the civilian oversight board, and then they also have an inspector general. So they all coordinate together. So I I just wanted to say I'm really excited about that model. They have a hybrid system. Yeah, where we're more independent and in all that. <clears throat> to, so uh, let me just, uh, I'm trying to, I'd like to put a, a real purposeful bow here because I think there's some good action items to come from the great uh, experience you had here. Um, first and foremost, I, I love the points around the, and, and I caught that in Mr. Whedon's report around the engagement and presence of the chief of police. If we already know, uh, did they announce the dates for the 2020 conference by chance? Just uh, it needs to be in a month of either September or October, twenty. You know the location. No, no, that's that's something that. Uh, oh, it, it meets every two years. Uh, well, next year it's going to be in. What's it going to be next year? Tucson next year. So next year is already secured, but the year after. Yeah, but twenty twenty is it? That's my 20, question. Twenty twenty one. No, no, 2020 is set. 20, and it's in Tucson. In Tucson. Right, so the dates are set for 2020 in Tucson. Uh, yes. yes. I'm not sure. It's, it is. Yeah. Okay, right. so here's my, here's my point. Okay, so let's confirm the dates for the 2020 Tucson National Conference. Mr. Whedon, you should take, you should share in succinct bullet points when you respond to Chief Anderson's email while accepting this re regular email, uh, regular meeting, and invite him to join you all uh, in tw at the 2020 meeting, uh, national conference. Uh, put this early, uh, you know, senior leaders need early notice, but considering so many of his peers on a national level were present, I could assume that that's a space where our chief of police yeah, should be, right? Uh, and I take Dr. Hilder's point about um, this in no way should be contentious. It certainly isn't on our point uh, at all. So share with him the findings, impress upon him the importance of this and the fact that his peers were there from uh, both similarly sized and larger sized cities. Uh, and then quite frankly, uh, welcome him to join you all as well uh, because our staff will be there next year as well. Dr. Uh, Mr. Pinckney. Uh, I believe the conference is August, starts August 30th and goes through September 4th. Great, year. okay. So m a ton of notice here. Um, most folks don't have their summer vacation set that early yet. So let's put that on um, his calendar. Please mark our calendars as well. I think uh, no matter our, you know, where we are on this board or outside, we certainly want to be aware of that. Thank you, Ms. Ross and Dr. Hildreth. Um, for one more point about the, um, you made a point on the registration. You said that it would be on, for the training, would be online. Could we make sure we also use our social media tools to blast out? Out and share uh, when the registration is live on our website so that folks can access it there. Yes, we will do that. Okay. Yeah, for the procedural, yeah, justice, training, and uh, police legitimacy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Whedon. Uh, Mr. Pinckney, um, for the mediation program, are we following along with uh, content in our folders here or uh, listening to you? We can do both. Um, okay. So the board has already essentially approved a mediation program. It was in the rules that were approved at the last meeting. Uh, this is just how I envision the program flowing, at least initially, uh, based on my research from and What's that document look like, the front uh, of it? It's okay, I just wanna make sure. Uh, and all this information was provided to the board at the last meeting and then was sent out electronically after that meeting. Um, so I hope everyone's had a chance to review it. Um, so essentially, uh, we could start at on page three. Uh, there is a flow chart that I will call borrowed from Atlanta, uh, kind of showing the initial process of how mediation programs tend to work. Um, starting with the complaint, going through an assessment of the complaint uh, by the investigators. Uh, the investigators will determine whether or not those, pro or those complaints are mediation eligible based on what's in our rules uh, and the facts of those complaints. Uh, if they are eligible for mediation, then they will be presented uh, to the officer first to see if the officer is willing to go to a mediation. Uh, if the officer is willing, then we will contact the complainant to see if they are willing to go. 
um, we will be working closely with the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center. Uh, they currently do have a program in place already that does kind of a community officer mediation. Uh, this program is intended to mirror that as closely as possible since that program seems to be working very effectively. Um, and so the, this proposal kind of just outlines everything through the initial complaint, through officer eligibility. Um, there's it's a lot of dense information in there on how officers would be eligible, uh, for example, if an officer successfully completes mediation and both parties agree that the complaint has been resolved, the complaint against that officer can be dismissed. Uh, that way it incentivizes the officer to participate in the program. Uh, that being said, you don't want officers out there committing some kind of infraction and then relying on the fact that they can just mediate as many complaints as they want. Uh, so my initial idea was that there would be one complaint within a 12 month period and no more than two complaints in 36 months. Uh, all of that is information that I will be keeping track of through spreadsheet database uh, to make sure that there are no abuses of the mediation program. Um, so the, the program is also designed that both parties will participate in good faith uh, with, and that determination will be made by the Conflict Resolution Center mediators who will be presiding over the mediation. Um, should uh, the parties fail to participate, um, if the complainant fails to participate, then the case will end up being dismissed against the officer uh, to encourage, again, good faith participation between the, both parties. Um, and then so some of the, the issues that I try to imagine might come up um, is the types of cases that would be eligible for mediation. Uh, these are going to typically be the more, I don't want to say minor complaints because there are no real minor complaints, but some of the, the lesser complaints, um, such as allegations of discourtesy, foul language, lack of professionalism, harassment, um, those are the types of complaints that I would see going through a mediation program. Uh, the more major allegations of use of force, those types of things would still go through the traditional investigation process. Um, a concern that I learned about while at MACOL uh, was that there are a few kind of issues that tend to happen. Uh, there's sometimes a lack of participation from the community because they don't understand what types of complaints can be resolved through mediation, what mediation even is. And the best course of action for that is strictly through educational, uh, since the staff tends to, or is planning to engage the community on a weekly basis that would be a good time to do educational presentations on what exactly the mediation program will do. Uh, as you can see on the back of this, there are brochures. Uh, those kind of brochures can be handed out to people both at police officer functions or in community functions or both. Um, the other major issue that I was concerned about was the cost of the mediation program. Uh, I met with the NCRC director uh, and they agreed to work with us on a trial basis for a year with no cost, no costs to the board. However, depending on if we want to continue working with them past that initial time frame, we would need to address that in the budget to make sure that they're compensated for the work that they're doing for the board. Um, and then, as I said before, the management of the program is going to ultimately fall on me to, to handle and make sure that everything is done appropriately. Um, I put it on myself because I feel like the executive staff already has plenty on their plate, uh, so it seemed that I was the most logical person to, to take over that. Um, and if the board's got any, or I do have one question for the board. Um, so when I developed the brochure initially, I, I copied from what Atlanta does. They have a citizen brochure and an officer brochure. Um, depending on how the board or what the board thinks is more appropriate, there's also the ability to do just one blanket brochure uh, for both officer and citizen to save paper, save printing. Uh, it's, it's however the board sees fit. Um, and these are, these are just examples. These are not the exact brochure that we'll be using. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. Uh, uh, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you, Ms. Pinckney, you did indicate that you attended the session in NACL. Um, 
Did you also refer to the documents that were attached to that section? Did you look at some of the examples from Seattle as well, their actually, logic model, et cetera? I, I did, I, and I actually contacted the, the young lady that presented for Seattle. Uh, she sent me a bunch of, of documents yesterday, so I haven't fully incorporated all of that into this, uh, but uh, I really thought that the information that she sent me, while dense, was very important, and it will be incorporated. Uh, this is not a finished product by any stretch of the imagination. It will, it will continue when we see what works, what doesn't work, and we'll continually mold it to make it as good of a program as we can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sweeney. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes. Um, I, I don't think that the board has to um, dive into this deeply because we did approve it in the rules as far as conceptually and then it comes down to SOP. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it needs to be vetted much more closely by the executive staff mm -hmm. before it's finalized okay. for language and for other matters. For example, there's discussion here about citizens. And we decided when we did rules that we're not talking about citizens because citizens raises other issues. Okay, so it's members of the public, things like that. There are references in here as to minor um, um, misconduct, and that language is used, and that language should not be used. There are statements in here as to certain types of matters that aren't subject to um, mediation per se, but the rules list different items that are not subject to mediation per se. <laughs> there are other matters here that it says y'all aren't going to mediate, which is fine, you have that discretion within you, but it says that the rules require them and the rules don't require them. So I ask that this be very, very carefully vetted that it be vetted within whatever the broader appropriate executive staff is, and then be presented back as to what you view your final to do, not for us to go into it in detail, but just say, yeah, this is the concept of what we're thinking. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, along the same lines, Along the same lines, I think this is an opportunity to uh, activate the bylaws and rules committee. Mm -hmm. That's, on the same page. That's so. hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, I know there's a difference between mediation and actually restoring the harm that has happened. I know that has to do with just with with the back end things to make sure that the agreements or whatever uh, agreements have come to during the mediation are solid. And I'm just curious um, if we can add that here. But that might be a conversation for the bylaws committee. Uh, if we're going to take it to the bylaws committee, then we can bring it up there. Ms. Ross? I think Mr. Sweeney was hoping to dissolve that community. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, as an SOP, I don't think this has to come to the bylaws committee. I think it's, I think it's a staff decision within the rules that were approved but it just has to be looked at much more carefully by a broader group mm -hmm. to make sure it's consistent with the rules and consistent with the policy and consistent with the general tone of, of what we're trying to present. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Well, well, in that light, I would like to present a concern about the mediation. Um, when I was reading through it, I could see it as an avenue for someone to intimidate someone to, be, to come to mediation. So I think that th that's a thing to maybe consider through language. Um, but that was, that was my main concern as I was reading through it. Ms. Ross? I was just wondering if Mr. DeGucci or maybe a, the Rules Committee could come back together to work with uh, Todd on this something very simple you know we worked a couple of weeks two and three times a week so I'm willing if the committee wants to come back together I second that motion I, I think that's fine 
The Rules Committee is mighty powerful. I don't get into any of those conversations. I stay far away from them. Uh, it seems that the, there's at least a general consensus with the committee itself. Um, does uh, any other members of the board have any thoughts or feelings towards that? If not, we'll uh, hold until our October 23rd meeting for the committee to meet uh, and then come back together, Mr. Sweeney. Just as a general concept, I, I don't think that we want the Rules Committee to get into every SOP. Right. right. Okay? But I do think that the SOPs need to be broadly constructed, carefully constructed to make sure they're consistent with what the rules are and other documents and things of that nature, and that they need to be shared within a broad enough group mm -hmm. within the executive to make sure that everybody who can look at and say, well, what about this and what about this, mm -hmm. all has that detailed input into it to make sure that you get the proper consensus. Because I'm really surprised that this document came out to us the way it did. I wouldn't expect it to appear this way. Mr. Sweeney makes a good point. So perhaps another, so while the Rules Committee will convene in between now and the next meeting, um, Mr. Wheaton, this will be a good, um, a good opportunity to add into your executive team or your all staff meeting, which I'm hoping that you're having regularly for these type of documents to be brought before the team ahead of time so that they can have, you can have general review output and perhaps it stays with your executive team, we leave that to you. Uh, but more eyes on documents is better than, than one at times, right? We, I, I've learned that myself. Um, with that said, I, I do want to pause and say, Mr. Pinkley, thank you very much for the work that you've put into this. We certainly appreciate it. Um, we're excited to see what comes next. Rules uh, uh, Committee, um, you, you certainly need to suit up quickly here uh, and, and figure out when you're going to convene and get that meeting on um, publicly uh, noticed here. And so I would assume at least within the next week and some change or so, you all are looking to come together. Um, if you all could uh, communicate that over to um, Mr. Pinkley and the other members of the staff, that would be great. Anything else on uh, the mediation program, Mr. Pinkley, that you want to share. Thank you. Um, for the DEC uh, MOU, um, we'll all turn our attention to um, the relevant uh, document here. Mr. Pinkley, you have the floor. Uh, so essentially this just uh, puts into writing everything that has been agreed to between DEC and community oversight. Um, uh, puts into writing the fact that we will be contacted uh, in certain situations when when the MNPD executive staff would be contacted. Or, uh, yeah, that's right. The MNPD executive staff, when they're contacted, our board will also be contacted. Uh, and that's a part of their, their RAVE system. They've, they've already put us into that. We're already receiving those. So this just puts that into writing. Uh, there was also the issue of documents, uh, and you can see that in there. Um, and so this has probably been through 10 different revisions between myself and then council for DEC and uh, the assistant director and director of DEC. So this is the, the final product for, for the board review. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions, uh, Mr. Cooper? A couple of things, uh, Mr. Pinkley. Um, both dealing with the section on confidential documents. Uh, first, just to note uh, the reference in paragraph number two to 38-8-352E. Mm -hmm. I assume that's supposed to be 38-8-312E, uh, which is the new statute okay. keeping our records confidential if they are obtained from a confidential source. There is no 352E. Um, then paragraph three, uh, MNCO agrees to withhold any information or documents obtained from MDEC from the COB board members until such time as that information can be presented in a proposed resolution report. Uh, MNCO will still maintain the confidentiality of any of those documents by properly redacting confidential information where necessary. A uh, few questions there. One, what sort of documents are we talking about here? Uh, so the documents that they were going to provide, they, 
uh, are listed above. So computer-aided dispatch reports, those aren't confidential, so we wouldn't have to worry about it on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there would be all related radio transmissions to any specific incident. Uh, and then 911 and non-emergency call reports. Uh, so their concern was that within those documents, there may be confidential information that they don't want shared. Uh, and the reason to withhold that information from the board is just in case in discussion that information would be announced at a public meeting while it was still confidential. Understood. So I would think the first sentence here, uh, I think it's a general policy. We are not going to, we as a board will not be looking at investigatory information until it comes to us with a recommendation from the staff. So I guess I'm not sure I see a problem on the first sentence. I want to make sure I understand the second sentence. You know, if a COB board member felt that reviewing this confidential information uh, would be important to making a decision, would the COB uh, board member have, be able to view that information? I mean, I understand not wanting to present it in a public meeting, but uh, can the board member under this MOU review that information if the board member feels it's important to making an informed decision? My understanding is that they can. Uh, the, the real they concern can. was they can. My concern okay. was that the the information being in this in this setting and during a deliberation type about what should be done with that particular case, that the information being released out to the public when it when it shouldn't be. Well, that's going to be true of any confidential information we have, not just confidential and confidential information in, from DEC. I just want to make sure that we are not going to have limited access to no. that information. Uh, and this was put in to alleviate some concerns from the executive staff from DEC. Okay, but this the understanding within is clear. We as a board, individual members, will be able to see that information yes. at an appropriate that, time. That's my understanding. and. Uh, if, once the board approves, if the board approves, then I will 100% clarify that with them before they sign it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sweeney. Yes, I think, I think it should be clarified in the document, though, rather than just an understanding, because here it says no. So if it's, we can see it in, you know, in the offices, but not at a public meeting, then it should be more specific. Or if we can see it at a public meeting, but cannot refer explicitly to the information. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, it, whatever it is, it should specifically right. said there rather than just be kind of we understand. Yeah. Um, yeah, a couple questions. Um, in, in paragraph number two, uh, where we have three items where we're going to get a call out, item C now is different from what it used to say. And that had to do with, I think, if a commander was called out or something like that. And that was changed at the direction of uh, acting Director Milliken. Uh, she felt that that was not necessary for the way that the call-outs are, com are conducted. Okay. Do we consider it to be necessary? I mean, are we comfortable with the change? Uh, and I can defer to Director Whedon on that, but I personally, well, I, don't, I don't know that those particular issues I don't know that it has to be in there. Okay, because I mean, that was what we had decided originally. We came up with that language for the third item. So if it's been taken out, I just want to know how we decided that we don't need it anymore or that this is the better language. Well, this is the better language. Okay, uh, okay then I'm fine with yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, in paragraph three, after all the discussions that we've had about timing, for getting information from the police department, there's nothing stated in here as far as time as far as when we'll receive the items in three. Is there a reason why? Is that automatic information? We don't, it's not a time factor, what is it? So uh, initially it did say a seven day time frame. Uh, they came back to us and said that they could not guarantee a seven day time frame depending on the facts of the case. Uh, the example they gave was the Waffle House shooter incident. Uh, those, all those records were put under a gag order by a judge and they would not be able to be released within that time frame. Right. So, I mean, obviously there's going to be situations that come up, but if we don't have time periods here, why do we care about time periods and getting information from anybody else? So, I mean, there should, there should be an, a normal time period subject to exceptions of mm -hmm. circumstances make it. So we, we need to address time as to whatever is relevant to our needs to perform what we're going to do. 
and then have a way out of it when there's an issue that we're comfortable with saying, yeah, we understand you can't do it within seven days or whatever because of that. And then we can work with that. But otherwise, you know, this could be months, this could be years. And so the general consensus between uh, Acting Director Milliken and Assistant Director Peterson was that the documents were going to be readily provided. I, I understand your concern with that. Um, you know, if, I, if everything's going to be given to us, we don't need an agreement. I, I mean, the only concern. reason we have an agreement is to make sure that everybody knows what's going to happen and how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen, because otherwise you don't need an agreement. And again, I understand your concern. The reason it was taken out was because they said they could not guarantee and, and I can understand the can't guarantee, but we got to figure out what the practical resolution of that is to address that some way, I would think. Um, and so, let me just be mm -hmm. clear so, so we can find a solution to this. So it, it sounds very clear, at least what I hear here, we need to find a middle ground is what Mr. Sweeney is saying here. I think we go back and we add in the seven days and say subject to, you know, exception, of, there's a gag order. I, I understand that, right? Um, but let's also be very clear here. Um, Milliken is also the person who says she didn't think that we needed an MOU to begin with. And I said, absolutely not. And I remember being very angry in the middle of a target when I got that call. So I want us to go back and include that um, and make it very clear. She can, it's, this is being televised, she can understand where the board is coming from, where Ms. Mr. Sweeney is making points, and I believe Ms. Ross has one as well. Um, but there's always gonna be pushback, I'm sure, but when we are putting words on paper, it's for a reason. And no one wants to be held to a number on a page, which is why we're putting the number on the page in the <laughs> seven days. Uh, Ms. Ross? I just wanna, uh piggyback on what you said, and I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that you're letting them tell you what they can do and what we cannot do. So I think we need to toughen up a little bit. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Sweeney, anything else? I yes. think you had a report. Yes. Um, there was a, a, a question um, regarding confidentiality and what's confidential and what isn't confidential. How are we going to know what we receive is confidential and what is not confidential? So the answer that I got to that question from the executive staff of DEC was that they do not determine what is confidential. That comes from the police department. Okay. How do we decide that what we have is confidential so that we know if we have to keep it confidential? That will have to come from the police department. How, how, how is it addressed here? We receive this X, Y, and Z, okay? We've gotten this. Where do I put it? Do I put it in the confidential protected vault or do I leave it sitting out on my desk? So my personal feelings on that is that I treat every inf all information that comes into my office, I treat as confidential until otherwise. But I don't understand how that works because the reports have to be made and reports have to be presented to and the that's board. When we would clarify so it. I mean, there's there's got to be there's got to be a way. I mean, you talked about certain things and you said these are not they don't consider these confidential, X, Y, or Z. Other things might be confidential, might not be confidential. There's got to be a way, whether it's dealing with DEC or whether it's dealing with the police department that we know for certain this is considered by them to be confidential and this isn't. Because otherwise, we can't do what the law requires us to do. And the law requires us to take everything that we receive that's confidential and hold it confidential. And therefore, we need to have some mechanism, either by categories of information or documents we're receiving, or because they put a big red stamp on it, that says it's confidential, so that we know where we're supposed to put it and how we're supposed to handle it. Because otherwise, we're gonna trip over it. And then we're gonna get blamed. And we want to make sure that we're doing this right. And I presume, you know, from the other NACOL uh, participants, that they've encountered the same situation before. And they can say, hey, this is how you do it, or this is how it's worked with us or this is the problem that we found when we first started out. But there, there's, there's gotta be a way. And if I could just yeah. uh, jump on that, I mean, if you go back and look at our statute, it is that 
you know, documents that are confidential under state law or any other law, under 107504 or any other law. So one, it can't be something that DEC just says we want kept confidential. It has to be something that is already confidential uh, as defined by state law. And yes, we need to know specifically what is covered by that uh, so that we don't violate the law ourselves. Um, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, Mr. Pinkley, if you could um, quickly contact um, Interim Director Milliken. We've is it uh, Anderson as well? Um, me, Peterson? Apologies. Um, uh, Peterson as well. Um, I remember quite vividly they joined us and emphatically shared with us that they were so very eager um, to, to have this MOU in place, that they would not be a burden or an obstacle. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly look forward to that. If for some reason, please, Mr. Wheaton, I'm speaking to you now, um, we are unsuccessful in having what I believe is low-hanging fruit revisions made to this MOU, please contact me immediately. Uh, I'd like to speak with uh, Interim Director Milliken personally ahead of the October 23rd meeting. Uh, and uh, if, quite frankly, in board, if that meeting does occur, I'll make sure that I uh, share out um, the occurrences of that meeting. Um, anything else on the MOU related to DEC? No? Okay. Before we move to the MEO MOU, I just want to say something here uh, on the record that I want to point out. We have uh, minutes in front of us in, in the packet um, here in front of us. We have not had time, however, to review them. Uh, in order to make a proper motion. There are several other minutes that we uh, need to review as well. Um, Mr. Wheaton, if you could please work with Ms. Person and other, any other member necessary of your staff. Um, we need to receive all of these minutes in one email, um, the, the various ones, so that we can read them um, all together. This also should include today's meeting as well um, and the executive committee meetings as well. We've I've given permission to kind of push back, uh, pull, you know, the, the delivery of these, um, but I don't want to get far behind in our review and approval of the minutes. So if we can make, make sure that's done. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, we, we're going to look at getting some, some minutes software, some type of software that okay. can help uh, Ms. Pearson in her, her efforts here. Okay, great. And is that, would that be available in time for the next meeting, or you're saying you're just we're looking at it? We're going to expedite it as, as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, she, she was overwhelmed with, with the minutes from the past uh, meetings that were kind of in rapid uh, succession. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, I hear you, but since we have time, we should, we, we are comfortable in this expectation that we'll have all minutes available for us for all preceding meetings uh, on the October 23rd date. Is that clear? Yes, Chair Davis. Okay. And we need to receive that email with the minutes um, at least, at least a week before. Um, so at the same time that you're sending over the report to me uh, that I will quickly review and turn back to you so that you can then send it out to the board. Uh, and I say at least, so I'm actually hoping for 10 days, but um, we should get that as soon as possible because that's a lot of reading and reviewing the board needs to do ahead of time. Mr. Sweeney. Yes, and if I can make one request as secretary now, and that's Mr. Whedon, after Ms. Pearson reviews the minutes, does the minutes, if you would then review the minutes and then send the minutes to me for my review and then I'll send them back to you that you can send them out to the board. I can do that, yes. And, and do it within time so that if I have a day or two, that'll give me time to review and get them back to you. But all of that in time so they can come out to the board a week to 10 days in advance. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the MOU um, as it relates to the Davidson County Medical Examiner. 
And this, this one's fairly straightforward. Um, that was drafted along with uh, the counsel for medical examiner, uh, Mr. Alex Dickerson, who was former counsel for the board, uh, essentially providing that uh, upon request, uh, we can receive the final autopsy report within 10 business days. Uh, and then the report will also contain toxicology findings uh, and will include body diagrams with the report. Uh, and then for the, the COB purposes, everything will remain confidential according to statute and uh, also HIPAA. Uh, and then notification to, to the legal counsel for uh, prior to any release of any documents. Thank you. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, I have a general question about the MOUs. Um, I see how on this one particular that we just got through talking about, number two, the termination, um, and then the amendment. It seems like if the MOU is working out in a way that doesn't align with what the board's mission is, that we should have an opportunity to amend it some sort of way without breaking it. But, I, but I'm not sure. I'm leaving that up to the legal experts in the room. Uh, sorry, I'm not on here. Uh, Mr. Pinkley, uh, did you hear Mr. Campbell? Uh, so if I'm understanding the, the question, in order to amend, we would just need to go back and renegotiate with counsel for medical examiner and with um, Dr. Lee. Okay, yeah, and I, and I was just thinking about all the MOUs, just in general. If it's not working out in the way, it seems like we would want to just amend, but what you're saying is we just come back to the negotiation. We, we come back to the table and negotiate further. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Cooper? Uh, yes, Mr. Pinkley, uh, first on, um, under the COB agrees to the following, uh, same correction needs to be made there with reference to the statute 388312 instead of 352E. And then uh, perhaps in light of our discussion on the DEC memorandum of understanding, uh, we could add under what DCME agrees to the following, uh, paragraph two, to the effect that they will clearly mark as confidential those uh, documents provided to us that are required by state law or by law to be kept confidential. And I'll run that by Alex and yeah. see if he's agreeable. But I did want to ask, because I, I pulled up the statute on my phone and it's still showing 388-352. Um. And we can, I can show that to you later and yeah. we can figure it out. Yeah, I ran it through uh, LexisNexis uh, to get the current statute oh. number and it's that part of that chapter of the code stopped at mm -hmm. 3112. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but mine's, in any mine's event, Westlaw, so it's, it may uh, just be, yeah, yeah. it may be different. It's, <laughs> it's a simple question to, uh, right. to correct. Yes. Sounds like my 1-0 year. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you, Mr. Pinkley. I appreciate it. Before we move to the COB, MNPD, uh, MOU, I just want to pause for a moment and uh, do some acknowledge one of our um, our colleagues needs to step away. If everyone can just pull their phones out for a moment, I'd like for us to look at the calendar, look at the month of November and December. I want to be thoughtful and about everyone's calendar here that is present. Uh, we have to make a decision about our meeting uh, dates for November and December, um, unless folks want to meet on Thanksgiving Eve um, or that of what's the other one on Christmas Day. Uh, and I love y'all, but I don't love you more than I love uh, Jesus. So, uh, so, uh, so let's start with November. Uh, we have um, one, two, three, four. So the 27th is the date. Uh, the 20th would be that week before. Um, I, I look at that one naturally just because it, it occurs right before, but is there a major conflict? I'm, I'm looking just for a majority here, uh, knowing that we can't find a perfect date. I'd like for us to stay on Wednesdays if possible. Um, would the 20th, um, is there any, maybe let me ask, is there anyone that the 20th won't work for? Um, 
or are we comfortable with uh, agreeing to move our monthly November meeting uh, to Wednesday, November 20th? Okay. Can I, I receive November? November, yeah, yes, Mr. Holloway. Can I, uh, is there a motion on the floor? Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Someone second. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Uh, any focused discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, nay. Abstentions. The motion carries. Thank you very much. <laughs> For December, um, we have, I mean, uh, it is hard in December to get uh, folks together. It just is. But we're going to do our best. And looking again at the preceding week, um, you know, the week that precedes uh, the week of Christmas is the 18th of December. Um, I'm sure there's a holiday party going on somewhere, but uh, it's for our folks willing to meet then on that December 18th date? Okay, anyone want to make a motion for that one? Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Mr. Cooper seconds. Um, any focused discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Nay, abstentions, the motion carries. Thank you very much. So our uh, November and December meetings um, will be November 20th, Wednesday the 20th, and then December 18th. And then we will reconvene in the month of January on January 22nd um, in the new year. Thank you very much. So that is uh, item 11 on our, uh, our agenda. I uh, should acknowledge here that uh, we will also today, and I see the bow here, but I have not really touched it until right now, uh, be picking lots, pulling lots here today uh, to determine our staggered terms um, uh, per the rules uh, that we agreed to. Um, and then from that also we will need to start to, and I really, this is more so Mr. Whedon with you and your staff, having conversations with Metro, the Metro clerk office um, so that whatever the proper procedures need to be in place for notice notification to the public um, on what happens next. Um, and we'll come back to that. So let me um, let me also be just really clear here about number 10. The only policy review I have in front of me is the memo um, that Mr. Martinez submitted. Is there any additional policy request for the board's consideration? There were two use of force incidents that were um were not complaints from the, the public. Well, one was a complaint from the public, but the officer was terminated. Uh, the other was not a complaint from the public, but they involved use of force uh, that we were looking at in relation to the training issues that may uh, be of concern. Uh, so the, those were those two issues. We're looking at the policy review in that regard. So is there a, a document in front of us for us to consider, or is, that it, or is it your no, your that's, testimony? That, that's, that's just the, the basic statement of what, uh, what the review would be. Okay. Uh, the issue, uh, the, the, the one that you have in front of you, deals more with uh, uh, a true policy uh, issue uh, of uh, a member of the public that made, made a request for uh, a policy review. Okay, so let me just be clear here. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be uh, efficient with our time. The first re request that you just um, shared with us is related to use of force. Use of force, right? Yes. And so, um, in, per our rules um, for a policy review to take place, uh, the board has to agree on that. We have to have a motion and approve it. Am I right about that? Um, yes. Right. Yes. We, we, yes, and uh, we can submit that. But uh, the basic. Essence of it is uh, we're looking at the training of the officers involved, uh, uh, whether there were, may have been some issues with training when the officer used the particular force in these two cases. All right. Uh, any, um, any additional information requested of the board on this, or is there a motion to, um, to uh, for this policy review uh, as a re regard, it relates to what, the use of force? Um, yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Martinez, do you have any questions? Okay, is there a motion? I don't. Mr. Sweeney, I'm sorry, go right ahead. No, I guess the motion is proper and then I'll raise an issue. Okay. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Martinez, in one second. No? Second. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Focus discussion, Mr. Sweeney. Yes, I, I don't know what the policy review is. I mean, use of force is something very general. Mm -hmm. And and 
I think here at the outset where we're just starting to do policy and we have our policy people, we have our time and all like that, that I'm fine to go ahead in that manner. Mm -hmm. But I think what we want to do is a couple things. Number one, we want to know <clears throat> from your office, what is the process that you're going to go through to make recommendations to the board to look into some policy matter? Among all the choices in the universe that might be out there, as far as policy things, how are you going to present? Do you have kind of a broad picture that there's seven, 10, 15 policy issues that are already on the horizon? Or is this going to be a one at a time matter? And who's gonna participate within your group as far as deciding? Is that a matter just from your your policy folks, and they're going to independently decide what they want to investigate? Or is that something that you, as the director, are going to set the scene on? I mean, I think there needs to be some kind of process mm -hmm. by which we do it, because we're going to have, over time, we're going to have limited resources. And we're going to want to prioritize and say, that's a really interesting thing to do, but from what we've heard so far, this is going to already take 75% of the resource that we have, and therefore, we don't think that we should approve that at this time. Some, some sort of way by which we can evaluate and we know what's being considered and, and the process and then being presented to the board as to this is what we want to look at and here's why. I agree. We can uh, we can submit a, a proposal of for for policy review. The the two issues that uh, I'm speaking of today, those events occurred before we brought our research analysts on. They were issues uh, that, uh, as I said, they, they they weren't complaints that were received from the public uh, based upon the actions of of, of uh, the officer involved, but because of what was observed in video in these two cases, there was concern about sure. there may be some training issues that needed to be addressed. Sure. And that's what we were gonna look at. Right, but the board needs to understand that yes. when you wanna make up policy kind of review and investigation and collect information so that we can weigh into it too and see if we can concur okay. with, with that. And we need to understand the process by which you're gonna bring something to us in the first place. Okay and then give us something to look at so that we can decide yay or nay. We can develop that and uh, submit it to the board. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. I appreciate uh, your comments there. Um, well taken and quite frankly, I actually would appreciate if someone would consider who made the original motion, um, was it Mr. Martinez, uh, to also include the policy uh, review um, this in front of us, the memo we received. Um, if we can take both of these under consideration in this vote, um, where it's very much, it is detailed out for us uh, what the request is and the review of it as well. Um, so, mm -hmm. so I move that we approve the policy review that the use of force policy review and also the policy uh, review request that I submitted regarding MNPD policies and immigration and customs enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. You want a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Um, and uh, now we'll return to any additional focused discussion. No? With that, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Nay? Thank you, Ms. Ross. I acknowledge your nay. Abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Whedon, um, I, I um, have to just ensure I appreciate this format. Thank you, Mr. Martinez, for raising this for, uh, for us. Uh, but if we can ensure, especially when there's a request before the board, uh, that we have uh, a very tailored and constructed uh, narrative in front of us for us to consider. Um, with that, I'd like to pause, so that will be uh, for our, everyone's review here, number 10 item on our agenda that we've just completed. Mr. Martinez, understanding you've taken the time to put this um, 
policy advisory report memo before us. Is there anything you want to publicly, um, you know, state about this? So, for I don't know if the members of the public have the request in hand, but basically, I'm re based on an incident in July this summer um, where there were Metro Police officers involved in an ICE attempt to apprehend someone who was in their driveway, in their car with their son. Based on videos from the incident, it didn't sound like Metro Police officers were fully aware of what the rights of this man were at the time. And um, it is, I think, dangerous for them not to know this in this situation. So I would really like our research analysts to find out any policy that um, MNPD has relating to immigration enforcement, any training that they receive, um, any training that they receive about enforcement, immigration enforcement jurisdiction, on the differences in the types of warrants. ICE can issue administrative warrants that are not signed by a judge, which means that no one has to comply with them. Um, any training on the evaluation of foreign identity documents that immigration uh, immigrants may have, and any training on uh, regarding immigrants' civil rights, because everyone has civil rights in this country, no matter your citizenship. Um, I would also like the research analysts to find out, if possible, the number of times that ICE has requested the assistance of M MNPD and whether or, and if they can find out how much that is costing the city, because I don't think that the federal government should be co-opting Metro's resources. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Thank you, uh, one, for raising this, for bringing it in front of the board. I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Whedon, do you have any questions about the, um, either the motion that's now being carried and approved or the request in front of you? No, I have no questions. Thank you. I also just want to note, I see here from Dr. Valier, we have uh, his, um, I just want to bring everyone's attention to this. I don't know if this is available for everyone. We've already gone across it, but this is also information that should be posted to the website for the public review and aware uh, awareness here. It doesn't say, however, when Dr. Valier was contacted by D Deputy Chief ha uh, Hager. Uh, but it would be great if that could be included. Um, I won't just assume uh, that it was on the date, you know, what date, but it sounds like it was shortly after our um, last public meeting here um, that there was a call saying that the three records requested form were initially quoted as being substantial labor fees and costs were suddenly zero dollars. Um, let's ensure this is shared out. If nothing else, it sets uh, an important precedent of how we can continue to work together uh, without misusing or abusing uh, taxpayer dollars, right? Uh, or purporting that tax dollars are needed in spaces where it's not. Um, I want to then move now to um, our COB MNPD MOU uh, and extend the floor here to um, both Mr. Wheaton and Mr. Sweeney. Or you tell me who needs to run the show here best. It's up to you, gentlemen. I'll start the process. That would be Mr. Sweeney. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, from the last time when we met, when the board tentatively approved the MOU going out to the public, uh, we then sent it out to um, a group of um, 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 community groups community agencies of about 20 of them into the police department. Um, and we also sent it out to a group of individuals, all of whom had applied for appointment to this board, trying to identify as many different people who we thought might have insights or input that should be considered uh, in, in the drafting of this. And we got information, we had a written information, we also had a public hearing, and uh, we received some information there as well. And then we went through and we did a redraft um, of the proposed MOU. And we had some other information looking at our rules and looking at other information that we had gathered from other places. So as a result of um, our initial work on this and the input that we received, we went, went through and did a redraft. Uh, as part of that redraft, we also looked at what the um, Chief Anderson had sent um, as far as his directive to the department 
as far as what they were going to do. And there were some aspects of that that we thought that we could incorporate into the MOU, and we did. Um, we had requested input from the police department as to the MOU itself, and they declined to participate up to this point. Um, so then we've gone through and we've redrafted. We also put in things for consistency uh, to um, uh, the rules that we drafted before, you know, for example, definitions, making sure that language was the same and such. Um, probably a good place to start, because there's a couple policy issues, is to start with um, Article 3, which is on jurisdiction. Because of the powers that have been given to us by the Charter, there's an overlap between our responsibilities and the responsibilities of the OPA within the police department. The question is, how do you address those? There's a couple different ways that you could do it. You could have neither group pretty much paying any attention to each other and just going on and each doing their own assigned tasks. You could have um, some allocation between the groups, um, and it's, it's pretty much one option or the other. In deciding what the best way to do this is, um, it's, it's also important that we consider the powers that this board has. Mm -hmm. And this board cannot make any decisions as to any alleged act of misconduct. It can only make recommendations. So if each, the OPA and we, were to do separate investigations of matters, then they may well conclude their matter before we conclude our matter. We then make a recommendation and they say, well, thank you very much, but we've already made a decision. And since we've already made a decision, you know, th there's nothing for us to do with your recommendation. What we thought prudent to do was to look at what is our core responsibility. And our core responsibility, although we have broader powers than this, our core responsibility is to look to matters that affect the community, that affect the public. So we make a proposal in this that those matters that are either public complaints or are complaints that come from any source, including the police, that deal with public matters that we handle those matters and that OPA defer and they wait for us and, and follow up on whatever recommendation that we make. As to other matters within our jurisdiction, because we have for any violation of the rules of MNPD, that we're fine to let the police department investigate those. Um, and it's, it's kind of a practical decision as to what looks workable. And that's how that division was made. But that's an underlying policy decision that's in this MOU. With the original discussions that Ms. Ross had with the chief and all like that, and Mr. Wheaton had, the, the police department showed no interest in that at all. So that's going to be a key point of discussion, I suspect, when it gets to negotiations. Um, but that's kind of a beginning point. Um, um, part four in here, Article four in here, has to do with co cooperation and access to records and information. Getting back to what we you know, dealt with several weeks ago. In this proposal, Mr. Yep. Um, Mr. Sweeney, actually, and, and let's uh, do this the way we've done it before. We've gone section by section, and then as there were points or questions, we raised them and, and tried to find a resolution with that. I believe, Dr. Hildreth, you had a point. Thank you, Chair Davis, because I did have the process whether you wanted to talk about everything or stop. Yeah. So if we're stopping on three, um, that explanation was very helpful. I had great difficulty even understanding what the issue was as I struggled to read the language, particularly in light of what we heard at the NACO conference with different permutations and matrices around this. So for my mind, the 
notion of a matrix is key. I am wondering if when this paragraph is clarified, could it be supplemented with a table that is showing? For these mm -hmm. types of cases, mm -hmm. there is either initial or exclusive or concurrent mm -hmm. investigatory jurisdiction um, and how they would dovetail together. If we can sort of puzzle that out and visualize it, mm -hmm. it might be a little bit easier for us to understand where we stand on that and two, to separate out the points for negotiation. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hilger. Mr. Sweeney, do you have anything to respond to that at all? No, no except at this point, this is the proposed final version. I mean, only for expediting the process so that we don't come back to the committee again. So I do, I do think that that's a good idea to put in there as a byproduct of the end of this process before it's finalized, you know, before it's ultimately signed off on by the board, if, if, if that works. Or are you saying as part of the process of review and approval that you would like the matrix to be part of it? Um, I think I was indicating that I would have difficulty sitting at the negotiation table with this paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, I would break it apart anyway, and I'm wondering if just simply articulating it with the table would help, but I think Mr. Cooper has a suggestion, mm -hmm. and I will yield. Yep. Simply that uh, I think your suggestion is a very good one, but I also uh, respect the need to bring this process to some conclusion here so that we can present it to the police department. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we could do as a side document and illustration uh, the sort of chart uh, that Ms. Hildreth is describing so that it's not a formal part of this document, mm -hmm. but an aid to the negotiations. Mm -hmm. Sure. Works. Okay. Uh, any additional comments, questions, or concerns around section three? Okay. If not, we'll move to section four. And if we could, uh, Mr. Sweeney, go by A, B, C, yes. D, D. That'd be great. All right. So this, again, has to do with documents and information. And um, Mr. Whedon has been able to identify three different types of information. There's the stuff that should be our library which is A, which is stuff that we will always have, it will always be current, we don't have to ask anybody for it, it's there for our reference, we have it, okay? B is the information that relates to a particular complaint that we request it and we get it very, very promptly as set forth in there by time period. Uh, three is the... Um, um, C. Sorry, C. C is the third group, which is information that we can wait upon, it, such as the databases and such. It has a presumptive time of seven days, but subject to negotiation uh, if, if there's a need for additional time to produce it. So this just breaks down all the information into three different categories um, that, that we will be entitled to one way or another. Do you want to pause for A, B, C before we move to D? Any, um, or do you want to go right ahead um, if you'd like to? I'm sorry. I was thinking there were three. There are. Yeah, we have D. Oh, yeah. Three, uh, A is just the introduction. B, C, and D are the three different categories. Okay. We're under, and you're under section four, correct? Uh, we're in section four. Okay, A, B, um, C, and I have oh, hold on a D hold here as the documents. No, cooperation. Yeah, cooperation and access to records and information. Yes. Um, yes, that's just the, the third category of documents. Mm -hmm. So we have the library, which is actually B, okay? Mm -hmm. C is the immediate and D is the database's longer term, seven days, negotiate. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, any points the board wants to make around section four? 
Okay, if not, we'll move to section five. Okay, this is confidentiality. And this is the um, provision that what we receive as confidential from the police department, we will maintain as confidential. It has a provision in there for requiring a clear identification of what is confidential um, so that we know that it is. Um, and then we make reference to the information that we're getting from DEC just to identify what that information is as well. Thank you. In fact, Mrs. Sweeney, feel free to proceed and I'll just okay. look for uh, name tags if we need to stop. That's fine. Um, six is intake investigations, and this is just the process um, by which we will be going through um, the investigation. There's a reference in there to the police manual, and that has to do with notice that's given to officers and how that process works, and we will go through a parallel process, uh, guided by a parallel process um, in that administrative investigation at that point. Mr. Mr. Cooper. Cooper question. Um, Mr. Sweeney just had a question, and it may be I don't understand the larger context on Section D of uh, Roman numeral six, whether an employee is notified um, of being the subject of an intake investigation or a witness to the investigation, department personnel shall respond to the notification. If the notification is going to the employee, um, I, uh, why is the department personnel responding to the notification? Well, actually, in that situation, it, it probably should say employee, but it's actually department personnel is just the broader category of the group of employees. Okay. That's all. Yeah, that That's might be probably right. just a poor, poor language choice. It probably should say employee. Perhaps again. worth cleaning up in yes, negotiations. Yes, agreed. Oh, I, I think even now. Yes. Okay. Section seven. Um, that's mediation that we talked about before. This just sets the general framework for the more detailed SOP um, that is developed by the um, uh, staff. Uh, there are certain time periods in there that are intentionally left blank for the purpose of negotiating those time periods. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, next is eight which is administrative leave. Um, there's a provision now that the chief of police can put somebody on administrative leave when they're seen as being a threat to themselves or, or others. Um, we incorporated that concept here where the director can make the request based upon information received that somebody should be relieved. And this then requires the chief to act upon that request within a set period of time. We're in section seven, excuse me, excuse section eight. We're in section eight. Eight. Yeah, yeah. sure, no problem, no rush. Uh, just a question on line three of Section A. Are you have a clean copy or the marked up one, just so? Oh, okay. Uh, the clean copy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Third line. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so fine. So there you are using the term police officer to make this more narrow than employee as used in other sections. Yes, because of being armed. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, nine is resolution reports, and that's the process by which they'll be prepared and presented to us, um, and then sent to the um, police, and that the chief's response set within a time period, 
and that once received that the chief's response would be posted as well as the report. Um, policy advisory. Could I, one question. Yes. Um, why 60 business days as opposed to 90 days or 12 weeks? Um, business days can get a little tricky to count when you yes. throw vacations and other things in there. Because that was the time period that OPA used, and oh, so really? we were trying to make it parallel. Well, uh, that's a good reason. <laughs> We weren't exactly excited over it either, but, yeah. but, but we figured it would be more confusing to have a different time period. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Policy advisory that um, also has the process by which we'll submit it to the police and it will be uh, returned back to us again within a 60 business day time period. Um, force review board. Um, this is a process that exists within the police department on the use of force, and this appoints Director Whedon or his designee to serve on that board as well. And I believe the chief has already agreed to do that, or has done it. Yes, the chief has agreed to do that already. Okay. Call out procedures. Um, part of this um, is in the um, um, communications um, MOU, um, which is why the change took place in A, to take out certain matters. And then uh, 13, 14, 13 and 14 now deal with what happens when there is a call out and you show up on the scene and the access that we get and when we get access to it. Okay, uh, 15. And 16, these have to do with training um, that will be provided to us by the police department. We have, in, in light of the experience we've had so far with the Citizens Police Academy, we've made specific um, modifications uh, that will address the, the challenges that everyone faced, faces as far as attending and, and um, what other access there will be to information for those programs that can't be attended. More a comment than a question. Yeah. Uh, I do think that some flexibility on the training uh, would be useful, but I think I would also caution against moving too much of this training onto computers. I think there is a great value to interacting with different parts of the police force through these meetings, and I would hate to lose that um, by making this too computerized. Agreed, and, and the concept of that is, as to those programs that can't be attended, mm -hmm. to have another way of filling that gap. So it's an alternative it's rather an alternative. than a replacement. Right. Then it's, I'm, I'm fine there's, with that. There's no intention of going just online. And that's it. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. To that point um, in training, so I guess that's paragraph 16 okay. in A. I um, was wondering if there would be a problem adding that CLB in consideration of attendance may instead request a hybrid program consisting of computer-aided comma, classroom, comma, and field training. And I, I'm asking about the word field because with the five weeks that we have completed, there have been times when, you know, we did the simulations and I or went to the equestrian stables and I don't know if that counts as classroom, maybe it's not truly field, but I wanted to indicate that that level of simulation was important, necessary, and probably needs to be honored here. I think it's a great idea, and I just stuck it in. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Well, yep, Dr. Hill. So I'll go to the next paragraph <laughs> since I got the mic. Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, the next paragraph, the academy will be a series of classes, a cumulative of, is that a typo of not greater? Of no greater. Of no greater? Oh, you meant no greater? Mine, oh, mine says no greater, so I might have so maybe it's no corrected greater. something. Or I couldn't see it, okay. 
Okay. Um, but then 30 hours again, and it's good to have these experiences with the training that we are doing, particularly if some supplemental training can be available online. I would not be opposed to having that, of indicating that we could do more tr training. I don't, I don't know what I'm saying here. Um, um, I don't want to limit it because right. the, I think that, for example, we did domestic violence yesterday. Mm -hmm. We did three hours, and there is a lot of rich material that if we had access to some online modules. Um, a few weeks ago when we did the traffic stops, they talked about verbal de-escalation at great length and did not spend any time teaching us that. Right. And after inquiry, they indicated that we might have access to that module that would be available. These are things that I would like to make sure that this MOU gives the board access to the training if they want it without saying you've hit your limit, you can't have any more. Right. What, what if I put in where it says a cumulative and put in a required cumulative? Right. Does that work? I think that helps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Any additional comments or requested revisions or thoughts on any of the um, sections of the MOU? Dr. Hildreth? <laughs> Thank you. So uh, they enumerated the types of training officer involved shooting verbal defense. There are eight um, items enumerated. Mm -hmm. I would like to add number nine, traffic stops. Okay. Thank you. With the request of revisions, is there a motion here to accept um, the MOU between uh, the COB? Excuse me, yes, the COB and MNPD so that it can move forward to the negotiation phase. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Uh, Ms. Ross seconds. Uh, any focused discussion on the matter? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Nay. Abstention. The motion carries. Thank you very much. It goes without saying. Um, that we certainly owe a great deal of uh, gratitude to all the members of the board that have uh, expended so much energy and time there. Um, one of them has his hand rated, raised, so Mr. Sweeney. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it would be beneficial to talk about the negotiators, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, who will um, work to get this adopted by the two parties. Um, I think that uh, a member of the board uh, should uh, participate with with uh, Mr. Whedon um, and Ms. Fitchard. I think that would be a good combination team to, to do it and anybody else that, that Mr. Whedon thinks should be part of it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, so I just suggest some discussion of that. I think it, you're absolutely right. Well, we'd be, be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that. And I think this goes to my earlier uh, comment around um, wanting to use the same format that we're using for our, uh, you know, the mayoral meetings, um, the representation. Quite frankly, I'll, I'll be honest with you. What, and you all said I have this power somewhere to make a committee of one somewhere. But um, I. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense that uh, the former chief of our, um, the city of Nashville sits in that sp space with the chief. Um, but I'm also open to other ideas here too. I said law enforcement in general and I recognize Ms. Holloway's service in that. Um, but I, I'm open to the board's ideas otherwise as well. I'm putting uh, Chief Turner on the, the spot here. So I should give you the mic, so. Uh, Madam Chair, if you are volunteering me, I will accept. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called volunteered. <laughs> I think I was volunteering Chief Turner. Uh, but if you wouldn't uh, mind doing that, I think it uh, would serve us well, um, working uh, closely with Mr. Whedon and um, Ms. Mrs. Fitcher uh, in that, those meetings, um, understanding that there's a lot of conversation still to be held here. However, I think um, we should use all the wealth of knowledge to hear in front of the board. So thank you, Chief Turner. Um, uh, Mr. Whedon, if you could just, um, and this is 
just for the board's awareness here, if you could just give us an update when that meeting is actually scheduled, uh, we'd just like to know, you know, that progress has been made there. And we know you'll be prepared and ready to give us a, a full report on it, too. Yes, I'll do that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wheaton. Uh, next, uh, here, someone, I know that Mr. Cooper always has um, uh, our rules on hand here, so he can read it to me on these staggered terms. I know, and it looks like my first anti's got it, too. Um, thank you. Uh, so, in accordance with, what is it, section two? Um, uh, it says, in the term of office, each member of the board shall be elected to serve a term of three years commencing February 1 of the year elected, except for the initial members, us, uh, who shall serve at least one year term, a one year term. The successive board members shall serve staggered three year terms. The initial board members agree to the following procedure for establishing staggered terms among them. A reads among the initial seven community nominated members as drawn by lot among them, two shall serve three year terms, three shall serve two year terms, and two shall serve one year terms. It goes on to then explain how the two council nominated members will serve and then the two mayoral uh, nominated members uh, will serve. And so um, let me pause here. I recognize we have three members of the board that are not present um, to, to draw lots here. Um, however, I do, um, and I'm trying to think of the best way to do this in, in, a, in a fair and equitable space here. We have eight members here. That would mean that, um, and that's Mr. So Mr. Campbell Gucci Smith, saying Dr. Lewis, and then Ms. March. Those are the folks who wouldn't be able to draw on their own merits. Um, if the board thinks it's appropriate, we can certainly wait till October 23rd and then um, pick then. Uh, however, I'm also, I mean, we have talked about this quite a bit. We can certainly pick tonight as well. Um, does anyone feel one way or the other on that? Or, um, and then perhaps I can send out an email to impress upon our board members the importance of being here and we can start in the, the beginning of it of drawing the lots. I'm open to either way here. I just wanted to offer both options. Mr. Sweeney. Perhaps a way to do it would be for the chair to draw for people who are absent. Okay. Is that okay with other members of the board and one um, dissent? Okay. Mr. Whedon or member of your staff, I see you have this in front of me uh, here, but I don't want anyone saying that I picked the one I wanted uh, out of this bowl. So Mrs. Fitch, I, yeah, if someone, even if it was someone, if we just go around in the space here, because I, I, is it written already? No, there's no names on there. There's no name, okay. But we would we be putting numbers on there, like two, yeah. one? I don't know. I, I think so. Yeah, I think um, numbers probably. Yeah, so, and I will, again, I'll think I'm okay. in it. Um, it looks like we need seven of them. Um, let's see here. You have to do an initial. Need three, three pots. pots. Yeah. Three pots. Yeah. Or, you, or you can do them one at a time. You can do, do one, one pot time. with the seven. Yeah. And then do another pot. Let's do. Let's start seven. with the community members, uh, since it's set the seven of us. Um, so two of them need to read three years. Three of them need to read two years. And then two of them need to read. Uh, should read one year. Two should read three years, okay. three should read um, two years, and then two should read um, one year. And we'll start there. So two of them is three, three of them as two, and then two of them is one. For community members, so I'm, I think my memory is pretty good on this, but uh, it's Miss Ross, seven of them. So let's start there and just put those in the the pot here. Thank you, Miss. Thank you. Um, and we'll uh, community members here will pick um, as well. Yep, all of those. Those is for the seven of us. Should include Mr. Martinez, Miss Ross, myself. Who am I missing here? Jamel. Jamel. Chief Turner. Chief Turner. Uh-uh. I don't think no, no. Mr. Not Mr. Holloway. Who is this? Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis. Is Dr. Lewis a community? 
Yes. Um, okay. Then Dr. Lewis. Okay. So that means that we would be picking for Mr. Campbell Gooch and Dr. Lewis, and the rest of us would be able to pick on our own accord. Yes, my apologies, Ms. Marsh. Don't tell her I forgot about her. <laughs> I know. Thanks, Ms. Ross. <laughs> You're right. Hopefully that channel's not working in her house. <laughs> Thank you. So, Ms. Ra, Ms. Fisher, or yeah, if you if you want to pass it down, that's fine too. We can just pass it down and pick. Yeah, if you could just shout it out for us, Ms. Ross. Or if you want to hold on to you till the end, that's fine too. Two years. Okay. Three. I was picking for myself here. One year. And then we need to bring it back, Chief Turner, bring it back this way. And we will uh you all think you want me to pick for Mr. Campbell? I'll go in order. Mr. Campbell Gooch um, is three years. Uh, in order would be Dr. Lewis, two year for Dr. Lewis, and then for Miss Marsh, two years. Thank you, everyone. One year for one year for Chief Turner. Okay, thank you. So uh, if we could pass, uh, let's just drop these in the book. Actually, for the next one, yeah, I'll be thoughtful about it. Um, for the next one, it's our two council nominated members. One will serve a three-year term, and then one will serve a two-year. So I will put in only the three-year. Excuse me, two-year. Yeah, three-year and a two-year, right? Yeah. I'm shaking it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, oh, thanks. It comes down this way. Actually. Mm -hmm. Oh. Are you doing mayor? Yep, council. My apologies. That's for you, Mr. Holloway. You're stuck with them. <laughs> I think that's great. Congratulations, Ms. Holloway. All right, so for our two mayor uh, nominated members, um, one serving a three year term and then one serving a one year term. Okay, so I'm putting the three and the one year in there. Just shaking it again. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. So uh, that means Mr. Cooper received a three-year term. Congratulations. And so we'll return to this. Make sure I'm, I'm clear here, though. That means we have one, two, three uh, members of the board who will be um, uh, rolling off. Uh, is that Would that be in February. That includes um, Chief Turner, um, Dr. Hildreth, and myself, uh, Ms. Davis. And so there will be three um, positions available on the Community Oversight Board. Mr. Martinez. Can they be reelected by council? Yeah. Yes. yes. I think if they uh, so choose to, yeah. Um, given the state's law that was passed yes. and the restriction that they placed on who could be board members. So they said the community oversight board shall not restrict or otherwise limit membership based on demographics, economic status, or employment history. I don't think that changes. I don't think that changes anything that we've done here. Yeah. Um, just something to keep on our radar going forward. I think it's a very important point. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Mr. Sweeney. Um, I don't know if tonight's the night to do it with the people who are here and all like that, but is it proper to consider whether we recommend to the council that those who will be completing their term in February to the extent that they wish to stay uh, be reappointed and, and for the 
the board itself to request the council to do that. Dr. Hildreth. As the mayoral appointee who drew a one-year term, I think that that would be up to Mayor Cooper mm -hmm. to make a decision mm -hmm. about who he would send forward to council, mm -hmm. would be my thought. I understand the spirit in which this is offered and certainly hope that the one-term members uh, will come back to continue this work, but I'm not sure it's a good precedent for this board to set to make recommendations as to who should be appointed to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Cooper. Uh, we should, um, one, Mr. Whedon, if you and your staff could definitely um, infer with the Metro clerk, um, that would be helpful. I'd like to ensure, one, as soon as possible, we can get information out to the public about the number of seats uh, available, if we need to con continue dialogue here as a board, um, if there is you know, something we want to suggest or recommend, um, I think that's fine. But I also am very excited about the idea of welcoming in uh, some of our community members um, who are eager to serve. And I was so excited how full that room was when, on that night. So, Dr. Mr. Sweeney. Can I just ask one thing as secretary, just to confirm what I have written down? Sure, to make absolutely. Sure that I, have this I think that's a great idea. Okay. Ms. Ross, two years. Mr. Martinez, three years. Ms. March, two years. Um, Ms. Davis, one year. Um, Mr. Turner, one year. Mr. Campbell Gooch, three years. Ms. Lewis, two years. Mr. Holloway, three years. Myself, two years. Uh, Mr. Cooper, three years. Ms. Hildreth, one year. Is that all correct? Sounds so correct. The three, so the three members who will complete their terms in February are Davis, Turner, and Hildreth. That's correct. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we now move to the public comment. Um, similar to the uh, last meeting, we have um, we have a list here in front of us. Welcome, Mr. Uh, Austin Davis to join us here um, in front of the mic. Mr. Martinez, if you wouldn't mind um, assisting us with offering a one minute um, warning there for the three minutes allotted. Mr. Davis, thank you very much. You're, please, yes, I think you should take the podium. Please, thank you so much for joining us. For the opportunity to freely speak about my concerns. My name is Austin Davis. I'm a longtime citizen of Davidson County. It's my understanding that you are negotiating with Chief Anderson on a memorandum of understanding. I would caution you to be very careful before signing any agreement with Chief Anderson. I believe that most rank and file police officers have a tough job and try to do their best. But we have a major problem with transparency, trust, and police leadership in Nashville. Prior to making any long-term agreements with Chief Anderson, Chief Anderson should provide 690,000 citizens of Davidson County with some truthful answers about retired police officer Richard Hillenbrand. Who is Richard Hillenbrand? Richard Hillenbrand was one of numerous members of the Nashville Police Department involved in a major sex cocaine scandal that rocked the Nashville Police Department in 1988. Who is Richard Hillenbrand? Richard Hillenbrand was the grand jury foreman in 2010 when a three-person grand jury panel led by Richard Hillenbrand denied the reopening of the Steve McNair murder investigation. The full secret grand jury did not hear the case, and the grand jury final report was not signed by Richard Hillenbrand or any of the secret grand jurors. If you wish to learn more about Richard Hillenbrand and the Steve McNair grand jury, go to www.thesilentbell.org. As I did at the September 18th meeting, I make a second public call for Chief Anderson to immediately resign. 
Thank you, Mr. Davis. Next, we have Constance uh, Mollet. Oh, Mollet. Yes, thank you. Is it uh, Mollet or Mollet? Mollet. Mollet, thank you. Beautiful name. Thank you, Ms. Mollet. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity. I know that there's probably a lot of people around this country, in fact, the world, uh, that would love to have an opportunity like this to uh, let you are uh, elected, if they can e even get elected officials, because a lot of them can't even have that, uh, they would be so happy to uh, participate in it. Now, I, I, when you talk about Detroit, I'm a born and bred Detroiter, and I remember that um, when I, we moved into a neighborhood, and I think I was like a we were probably the first black company uh, family to move into the neighborhood. I didn't even know. But I knew somebody was knocking on the door all the time, harassing, and my husband was in school getting the, uh, the Bachelor of Laws. So I, I finally called the police. And the police were very kind. They told me what to get for defending myself and then to use it if they came into the house. So that was really my first. I used to teach, of course, and of course that wasn't my first and then as a student, I was my first opportunity to be in front of the police or police that way. But they, he was so helpful. It gave me a lot of confidence once he did that. Now let's go over to Nashville. I uh, know that there was uh, finally the... Um, the uh, FBI, CIA uh, were able to uh, find uh, these uh, drug pushers over there on Buena Vista Pike. And I knew that those Buena Vista Pike uh, people were, uh, they were, they're foreigners, and they had that store and uh, that sort of a block-like thing, or half a block, and they were doing all kinds of things. I lived right next door to them, and I would, um, I noticed that they were, uh, vandalized my car. They were people that were uh, breaking up the um, uh, the windows on the car and everything, but they finally got it. But this, the FBI, CIA was very, very slow. And the last thing I want to say is now I have problem with my neighbor who lives across the street from me. He has a nasty attitude, which I don't care about his attitude, but I feel afraid of him. He's always, uh, he stands up and he uh, says, oh, she's peeking out the window. Well, he shouldn't, what is his business if I peek out a window that we're paying for our property? Property, so he doesn't put a dime into it. But that's the nasty attitude that I am afraid actually of him. So I just wanted to bring that up to let you know that uh, we live on a Lebanon Road uh, there, uh, and he's number 56. Just to know that and share that information, because some of these people do frighten you. They feel that because they are tall men or what have you, that they, have, they can hurt you. And so that's what I'm complaining about at this time. I hope it's all right to complain about it because I don't feel comfortable going to Hermitage Police. Mm -hmm. See, I could go to Hermitage Police, but I don't feel comfortable about them. Mm -hmm. They have a hidden agenda. They're all friends with, in my estimation, which I've been told, with the criminal anyway. So that's the way I feel about it. I want to say thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Muller. Thank you. Mr. David Tucker. Thank you, Chairperson Davis. I'm not going to show up at every one of your meetings. We uh, hope you do, Mr. Tucker. Matter of fact, you can come take one of these seats. Apparently, we're getting up. <laughs> but with the passage of the COB, it became clear that um, policing in Nashville needed to change. And it's in this context that I am perplexed. And to use one of Chief's words that he used in the report back to you, I am dismayed. I am perplexed and dismayed that the chief will not appear before this body. Um, I don't understand it, even from a public relations standpoint, to coin one of his other phrases, even if he was morally disingenuous. In his appearance, it would help him I am convinced that he is not showing up to really flex who he thinks he is. And it is my hope that as I listen to you all deliberate and dot the I's and 
cross the T's that you would continue to do that because I think the leadership in the MNPD must change if the COB is to be effective. Years ago, he went on record, well, it hadn't been that long ago, about three years ago, he went on record dismissing the 21st century policing report. And I heard you all talking about it. So all these issues are pointing out what I think is gonna be a inevitable showdown. Either the COB will do what the people want it to do, or either there's gonna to have to be some major changes in the MMPD. Even the records request bears that out. He went on record to tell you that it would cost millions of dollars and take hundreds of years and do all this. He's gone on record multiple times saying things that I think are inappropriate for a chief law enforcement officer of any municipality to say, only to come back this week and they just downloaded the files and gave it to you on a thumb drive. Um, all of this, I believe, is um, gonna have to be dealt with in a way that there just needs to be a change. My last comment is to you all who are working. You're in a job where you're not gonna find a bunch of friends, but for you to do the job right for us, that's the consequence. We need you to not maintain the status quo, and we need you to not get discouraged for when you meet those blocks. Do not compromise because we don't want compromise. And so we're going to do everything we can. And I say we as part of the group of folk who work real hard to make this happen is that we will fight to get the right commissioners or we'll fight to get the right staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Thank you very much. That uh, concludes our list uh, here. I want to um, I want to thank um, both um, Ms. Mr. Davis, Ms. Millett, as well as Mr. Tucker um, for the time that they've shared in their experiences and their stories here. Thank you. Uh, and while you were saying kiddingly, you know, you're not going to come to every one of them, we actually encourage that. It helps inform us here. It's the very reason why I'm constantly asking, what are we receiving in our email box uh, and why we wanted to get this stood up? Um, it's important to us, and it does inform the things we're thinking about, and sometimes the things we don't even know that are going on. So thank you very much. I want to move on to our new business uh, and announcements. So is there Mr. Martinez? Um, I just want to point out something something to the board. Um, there was a letter to the editor on September 22nd in the Tennessean yeah. from new council member Robert Nash out of District 27. Um, is it okay if I read it? So, <laughs> one of the goals put forth by the proponents of the Community Oversight Board was to build greater trust and understanding between the community and the Metro Nashville Police Department. Unfortunately, we find the board asking for unreasonable amounts of archive data of questionable relevance to anything before it. We also find that the board wants information that is prohibited to them by state statute. In addition, the board has demanded that the police department do the board's work in building relationships with other partnering emergency agencies, such as the Emergency Communications Center. Now the board has gone to the media and accused the police department of not being cooperative. I question how productive this approach is to building the promise, trust, and understanding. I know the leadership of MMPD is willing to assist the community oversight board, but the board must be realistic in its demands. As one of the persons who has been skeptical of the COB as structured, I urge you to prove me wrong. Get your staff under control and focus on these goals for which you were created. I just wanted to point that out that we have a new Metro Council and each one of us has the ability to go talk to each Metro Council and explain to them what's going on because I didn't see him at the meeting. I don't think I've seen him at any meetings. So based on our understanding, obviously, Mr. Nash is a little misinformed here and based on what we learned today based, based on the records that we've requested that have been produced at no cost. So I would urge all of us to meet with every single council member to discuss the work that we're doing to clear up any misunderstandings like this. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. I, I appreciate you raising that. Um, there's, um, 
very much, and I, I appreciate the point that you just made, too. I, I haven't seen Mr. Nash uh, near any building we've, um, uh, we've been in for any meeting, quite frankly. Um, but that's certainly a strong and, and inappropriately inaccurate um, opinion he put out there. Mr. Holloway. Yes, um, I'm quite familiar with Bob Nash. We graduated out of the police academy together. Bob and I were sitting beside each other when we were being voted on in the oversight board, and he did not get selected. And he, my wife saw it on TV, and she said he was very upset about it, you know, so he's not going to have a good taste in his mouth about the oversight board. He used to be the president of the FOP, and we, the National Black Police Association, had to file a lawsuit against the police department to change the promotion process because the way the promotion was going, we weren't getting our fair share. So Bob is, does not have a good taste for us. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. I appreciate Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. Um, I probably should have spoken up earlier. You did appoint a committee of one around the um, records, the information to be posted to the web. Mr. Whedon did cover that in his report, but I would like to share this communication. Um, that meeting was September 18th. So on September 19th at 12.44 p.m., you know, not 12 hours after the meeting, um, Mr. Keith Durbin from ITS wrote this. Dr. Hildreth, I was upset when I reviewed the COB video from the meeting yesterday regarding the discussion of what Mr. Whedon had been told could be put on Nashville.gov. My staff and I are absolutely committed to working with you to right the misunderstandings on our side of your needs so that you may get your important messages to the community. As soon as I get to the root of the issues, I will be back in touch with you on how we will remediate the situation going forward. I apologize for any disruption that this has caused. Respectfully yours, Keith. I responded, Keith, I so deeply appreciate your shared sense of concern and urgency. You and your office have been phenomenal partners in ensuring public access to COB work from day one. I have every confidence in your ability to protect and promote our commitment to full, timely, and transparent access to our public deliberations and the documents and data upon which they are based with gratitude and respect. I copied that to Vice Mayor Shulman to make sure that council received that notice and to um, Mr. Marcus Floyd, who was at that point still the contact in the mayor's office as well as to Director Reedon. So um, transparency means recognizing and honoring those who do respond to us and stand with us. And I wanted to make sure that this act uh, was noted on the record and that it was a companion piece to the action step that you received in the packet today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing with the board, too. It's also quite exciting to hear that there's leadership um, that exists uh, in various parts of Metro. We know that permeates throughout. Um, we hope that that, quite frankly, kind of leadership can rub off in, in our uh, space of our Chief Anderson as well. That's what it means to be collaborative and to work together. Um, Mr. Wheaton, uh, while we have the ear and cooperation and we see it uh, in, active, you know, in action in front of us around ITS, I believe I remember you or maybe a member of your staff saying that there were IT requests that were outstanding or that you needed help with, applications of software. Am I right about that, that you were waiting to um, have access to to make the, uh, uh, the roles of your staff easier? Uh, the main one is uh, IA Pro, where uh, that, that's some software that we need. Um, Mr. Durbin, he, he's been nothing but helpful. Uh, he and his staff, uh, uh, we need to schedule a, uh, a conference call with the folks of, at IA Pro uh, who are in Canada. Um, they sent some information to us last week when we were in Detroit uh, about setting up a conference call, but we haven't had a chance to do that yet, but we will do that. Uh, and uh, Mr. Derby will be on a call along with his, uh, his web people. So we'll, hopefully we'll solve that solution rather quickly as well. Okay, so that sounds like something this person can help you 
do just looking across calendars to find something. I mean, luckily Canada's not too far out of our time zone, yeah, right? Yeah, can't yeah, be so too bad, um, no matter what side it's on or even in the middle. So uh, please, let, let's work together. It sounds, it's very clear he wants to continue to work with us and continues to extend his staff and others to help us as well. Thank you. Any additional uh, announcements or new business? If not, the only last thing I want to point out, Mr. Campbell Gooch had to leave here, but I want the community to be aware there is a um, an art and activism event tomorrow that Gideon's Army uh, is uh, um, has a, putting together and coordinating. He didn't ask me to announce this, but I received this through another contact. It's tomorrow from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, at 1323 6th Avenue North. Um, and certainly, I'm sure you can easily find information of it online when you search Gideon's Army. But as an organization rooted and based in the community, I thought this would be a, a good space to announce that. Uh, with that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. In one second. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Any focus discussion? No, there never is when it's time to adjourn. Uh, hope is in favor. Please say aye. 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 Nay, abstention. The motion carries. Thank you very much. We're adjourned at 6.49 p.m. Thank you very much. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.